welcome to 372 Pages We'll Never Get Back. I am Connor Lestoka, joined by Mike Nelson. And today, we are wrapping up the worst book published, at least one of the top three worst books published in 1897. Irene Isley <laughs> by Amanda McKittrick Ross. Big wind up, deep breath before saying that one. I think we stuck the landing there. Uh, how do you feel about wrapping up this one, Mike? How do I feel about wrapping up Irene Idsley? <laughs> what did you, you said? Irene? Irene? I, I thought when we looked it up, I thought it was, they were Irene mm -hmm. with the re being emphasized, which is almost impossible for me to do. It is my Ogden, I will fully admit it. I, Irene, Irene Idsley. Because she wants it to rhyme. I, you know, well, that sort of rhymes, I guess. Does anyone look at that? And respect the, it? No. Uh, well, does anyone look at it and pronounce it that way without being coached for at least three weeks? Yeah, it's, mean, like, it it's like the old goatee hook joke. Like, oh, well, that's actually pronounced fish because it's the... Right, uh, yeah. No, I, yeah. I thought about doing a, a pocket operator cover of, of Lead Belly's Goodnight Irene. For the end of this, <laughs> <Sure>. but <laughs> wedging it in. Maybe, maybe I'll still tackle that if people are enthusiastic. It, it seemed like a lot of effort for an extremely one-note joke. Yeah. Well, all that aside, uh, your question is going to be answered thusly. I'm extremely excited nice. by, by this book. Uh, it went in places I could not have imagined. Uh, it went in places I could barely understand, but still... Uh, when you once you <laughs> once you work it out, uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, I mean, we we get a, a litany of suffering and misfortune in this book that you know on its face it's is of course not not funny except it's hilarious in this book because it's <laughs> you know it's like the well, it won't be the last time I compare it to the room, but uh, you know the ending of the room is obviously not funny if taken taken at face value as a betrayed man. Uh, blows his own head off however it's extremely funny because the creator was so inept and that's exactly what happens in in ii right here <laughs> yes in uh in, in ii there are many uh, uh empty tvs are picked up and thrown out of many rooms it's yes. uh, it's amazing <laughs> so i'm excited i want to uh oh first of all we, we won't have any real or fanfic today. unfortunately no but we have your uh, real or I... fanfic up, updated statistics we can we can tease that Okay, that should be exciting. I feel pretty good because I think I had a decent run in this one. As yeah, I yeah. You had a series against the Marlins where you went, um, you know, uh, 10 for 12 and, and raised your batting average by .03 for the season. Right. That's things worth <laughs> celebrating. My magic number is getting smaller. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, d we said who we were and what this is and everything, didn't we? We did, right off the top. Okay, good. All right, so we're covered there. Yeah, so we're we're talking about this, and I I have a quiz about Ooh. Irene Idsley for okay. you be, because apparently it becomes important, and this is hard to know. With this, I, I compared it offline with you to the Quilters book, where it's so much thrown at you that it's hard to know which one am I supposed to pay attention to. Remember, which, we had a which character we, you mean? Yeah, which yeah. <laughs> which in this litany of characters. <laughs> Is ever going to reappear? And sure. short of having an ebook and searching the name, there's no way, of course, to know this. So uh, at the end, this won't spoil anything. I don't think. Okay. For, I mean, for those well, hopefully, who are, yeah, for those guys, for that, for that subsect. Yeah. This, this, is, these are peripheral characters. How though some of them reappear? <laughs> right. So, I, so I just want to ask you. Um, this is a little quiz. Okay. And and you can get bonus points. So but, you want uh, me to identify what this character's role was? I want you to... Uh, I'm going to be more specific than that. Okay. <laughs> I want to know, um, in the sale of the Dilworth Estates, who who bought Dilworth proper, the Dilworth Estate? Uh, so Lord and Lady Dilworth were Irene's adopted parents? That is correct. Uh, they fell, as you know, they fell on hard times once she jet, jetted off to, right. where did they go on their honeymoon? I thought they went to, uh, to America again, but maybe they went to like the locks of Scotland. Same well, things I thought, recently. I thought they went to an exotic <laughs> island and, and sat on, on deck chairs. I don't oh, okay. know. I, don't, I, don't I, I do not remember who bought their mansion. That would be the Marquis of Orland. <laughs> 
Right. He returns. Right. Right. Yes. Delightful guy. Yes. Uh, who purchased Iretown Estate? Uh, uh, his uh, his name is alliterative. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> well, I mean, we have Oscar Otwell. Is that who bought it? Oh, with good, his thousand dollars from the sale of Audley Hall. Well, no, that, uh, I mean, oddly, that's another quiz. It's like, can you draw a map of all the halls? <laughs> yes, yes. Everything seems to be very near each other. It's always fortunate when a character is uh, forcibly evicted from their house, they can go move in with their sister who's nearby. It's, it's trucking through time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Who, that would be Lord Henry Heaton <laughs> purchased Ireton Estate. And my he, second question, Yes. What, what the hell is Ireton Estate? Well, that is the, uh, everyone knows that that, makes less money i'll explain that in just okay, a moment okay you sure <laughs> but the uh where did how who bought howden that was the third manor from the dilworth estates oh yes i do not I remember can, I, her i can give you a hint no, pito the great work. artist you'll know you'll remember once i tell you what he what his uh he's a famous historian and the national bard oh yes it's on the tip of my tongue it's uh Sir, Sir Rowland, Raul, Rowland Joyce. Sir Rowland yes, Joyce. Sir yes, Sir Rowland right. Joyce. Yeah. I've, that's funny because I'm looking at, I have the poster up right on my, on my wall here of Sir Rowland Joyce. And I just, it, it, I didn't put two and two together. Bonus questions. Who lived at uh, Iretown Estate before it was sold? God damn it. The Earl of Tuckersham, of course. Tuckersham? <laughs> yes. Wow. Anyway, the, the Ireton Estate covers the southern portion of Cheshire, owns a magnificent hall, the residence of the Earl of Tuckersham, and is not considered as lucrative as Dilworth. This was in, like, Chapter 3. Oh. Uh, may be estimated a handsome dowry for the son of any rising nobleman in the realms. The Howden Estate on which are elegantly formed two buildings of note, namely Blandford Castle and okay. Waterdale Lodge, both exquisite construction and architecture and skilled workmanship and occupied respectively by Sir Sidney Hector and Admiral <laughs> Charles Depew. Oh, my so, God. So if you had gotten those, I mean, I would have... Yeah. Uh, I would have flown to your home and carried you on my shoulder and filmed it all. Or alerted authorities that, like, obviously I had some sort of deep problem yes. that it needed to be carried out in a net it seems i mean i don't know if i, I don't remember uh, if i made this comparison before but i definitely thought about it it's like when you do a kickstarter or a patreon backer level and you're like hey for for a hundred dollars a month i'll put your name in the book lord lord uh lord rick sham of hugh or whatever are you talking about sir Sidney hector or admiral <laughs> charles Depew? i was talking about both of them Okay. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll, uh, for two hundred fifty dollars, I'll name a hall after you, Ned Blandford. So let's uh, you know, <laughs> cough it up, and there we go. Oh, just amazing though, because the only reason I bring that quiz up is because towards the end, one of those names came up, <laughs> and I just was like, "What the? Oh wow, you got to be kidding me!" And so nice. I did the control Y and was like, "God." <laughs> yeah, I've done that multiple times, and it always never comes up. You know, it's it's always the first time something's mentioned. So I'm eager to see who gets a uh, reappearance at the end of the book. Another shout out. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> that's great. Uh, shall well, we dive in? Yeah. Uh, just one headline. This was not an email, but someone sent it to us on Twitter oh, the sure. other day. A listener named Kara uh, sent us a tweet that said, when you drop a shameless 372 pages reference into a headline at work, and it's still in the top stories two days later in front of God and everybody. And Kara is a writer or editor at Crunchyroll. And yeah. she, she pu- published a, a, a story with the headline, this, cus- this custom Hatsune Miku PC is one hell of a rig. <laughs> so nice. and and you know you know uh hatsune miku is the uh generative uh thing where you can make you she's a, a virtual pop star and you can turn uh program music for her and she'll perform it and she does concerts and stuff yeah so it's a <laughs> you said yeah with a lot of confidence there kevin did a song in in the style of one of her songs at some point in time anyway so there, someone made a custom rig for her and then down in the comments uh listener uh i mean user bud g13 said I understood that reference in the title. <laughs> so, so, so someone she went out on a big uh, on a big limb there, and uh, it paid off in the comments. Well, the the fact that it uh, it works 
even out of context is right. yeah, a testament to the enduring and lifelong uh, quality of that quote. Someone commented on, on his comment, uh, I think after, after we tweeted it out, so probably a listener who said, uh, hey, bud, did you recognize it from 372 pages or for the inflatable Fredish forums? <laughs> <laughs> and it would be amazing if he was like, what's 372 pages? <laughs> right. <laughs> Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is delightful. Thank you very much, Kara, for, for keeping it going. But yeah, let's jump into the book. Let's let's uh, brief recap as we as we get started. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with the easy stuff. Um, uh, I, I, Irene Ittles Lee uh, marries Sir John. Yes. All right, you, you take it from there. God. Well, <laughs> she uh, then betrays him by having a, I don't know if it's called an affair. It's definitely an emotional affair. She was committing adultery in her heart like Jimmy Carter with her tutor, Oscar Otwell. Uh, John found out about that, locked her up in a murder room of their house. We get some specifics about that later, which is delightful. Uh, and this is all despite the fact that their son was, I, mean, I believe, two months old. It was identified in this chapter, uh, in this section. And uh, she later escaped with the aid of a uh, horrible woman, Rachel Hyde, and a, a just blessed saint of a man, the footman Tom Hepworth. Uh, they, they sailed to New York after— Well, they... wait, no, no. Tom Hepworth and Rachel Hyde screwed up, but it was Mary, what's her name, that helped, right? Oh, sure. The blessed, yep. God. The blessed yep. and wonderful. Uh, she, she gets like one more mention. Maiden. Yeah, she goes off and marries someone. Right, you're yes. right. You're right. They yeah, they just yeah. both kind of blew it. He um, just he he takes them out and does the three stooges slap on their faces, where he's yeah. like, "How are you idiots!" And the one guy's is an absolute. So the rest of the household, the rest of the what does he call them? menials? Yes. The rest of the menials like <laughs> just weep with, but when the slap lands on her face, then they all cheer like it's you know soccer team or something. Yeah, it's so. very much. Uh, it's not Fred Wesley, Brad Wesley berating, <laughs> berating Tinker, Tinker, and then the no, he, tall guy Tinker's O'Connor, who's yeah. a bleeder, I think. Who O'Connor's a bleeder? Yes, yeah. yeah. um, <laughs> that's a, a roadhouse. Um, spe- very specific, not very popular scene. Anyway, uh, so that's where we are. They have moved to New York. And Irene and Oscar move to New York. Uh, Sir John is at home, sort of growing progressively weirder and Howard Hughesier. But it, uh, chapter 15 starts off with a uh, little fortune cookie aphorism. I'm not sure if it's true. The wealthy, the haughty, the noble must alike taste of disappointment. And the first time I read that, I thought it was like, you know, the, the, the tall and the short, you know, the rich man and the poor must all, you know, bow before, yeah. you know, but no, it's just talking about wealthy people and, and nobles. And I'm like, I'm not sure if this is true. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they seem, uh, they seem very isolated, uh, much more than the, than the poor in this book against that type of taste. Yeah. they they seem pretty isolated at, uh, Blandford estate <laughs> and, uh. <laughs> it seems like they're doing all right for themselves, especially when they sell it off. Yeah. Uh, Maybe she just meant it. characters in Irene Idisley must taste of disappointments, because that seems to be the one unifying theme here. That's true, although in the classic, uh, what is it, the difference between comedy and tragedy? They, they're the... Uh, they're in charge of their own fate here. So sure. is this really a comedy? We can get into that later. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they... Uh, <laughs> Did you like this particular uh, uh, fortune cookie beginning? I thought it was a little weak compared to the others. Yeah, it's not great. It, it doesn't really have any metaphors. There's no orbs. It, uh, it sort of keeps going for a while, so I didn't even paste the rest of it into my, into my notes. Yeah, no, it doesn't really get rolling. You, you kind of read this one and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's like, uh, um, well, we, we've had a lot of these. Oh, the dolling in uh, Model Land. Yes. Where you start to roll your eyes at them and go, okay, fine. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it really picks up steam when it gets to Rachel Hyde. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, you know, we should just talk about what Amanda McKittrick Ross thought about her fellow women, you know? <laughs> Cause in the, yeah, that, yep. In the exactly. book, for the most part, uh, you know, the men get a, men get a pass for the most part. But the women she just drills down on and just absolutely dis- is disgusted by them. And she, she really goes after this uh, this poor, well, poor woman. We, it's really hard to get a picture of who she was, but this is how she describes her. Uh, they had now no domineering, domineering inflictor of petticoat power to check their honest actions or words. <laughs> and I, my thought was like, you know... 
women strive to get ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, she becomes the head of the, the staff, and then, only to be called a domineering inflictor of petticoat power. <laughs> I prefer girl boss. That might be just a, a <laughs> yeah, touch better than... Man. <laughs> man, I bet there's some websites about domineering inflictors of petticoat power, though. Oh, my goodness. No eyes of dreaded terror viewing through spectacles of sin their little faults. And she says, uh, she, she says that... Uh, this is how she ends up. She had at last been cast on the mercy of a world of icy indifference to facts of long standing and made to taste the stagnant waters of pity, which flung their muddy drops of rancid rascality on the face of dogmatic dread. So again, it's it's like uh, Mark and Lisa discovering Tommy Wiseau's body, and she Lisa's weeping, and Mark just goes, "You did this to him, you bitch." <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's 100% what's happening here. Rachel, I mean, Rachel was a jailer of a, of a, you know, a woman who had, you know, she was not innocent, but, you know, she was, she had not had a trial of her peers or anything like that. So not, not, not great. She was just following orders, but uh, it, she does. I uh, mean, it is, you got to admit, it's a funny thing that like, so you, you have a stern, you know, what is she like head of household, whatever. I forget what her title is, but she's kind of stern and a taskmaster. And then one day you go like, Hey, um, I'm going to throw my wife in, in prison and never let her see the light of day. Like, this is obviously, this is deeply, deeply evil. Like, yes. it's beyond beyond anything I have ever brought up before. Like, when I said, could you ignore the fact that I wrote that check and I, it's off the books? Sure, you know? yeah, right. And, and then her response is, yeah, sounds good. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's sort of like, you know, putting an ad in the paper for, a, you know, hey, I'm a cannibal. I'd like to eat you. Is that, uh, and then it comes back like, what? Yes? Yeah. Oh, okay. The, the phone's blowing up. I, know. Or, I, I like to imagine him, him having that conversation like in the, in the break room, him just coming in and, you know, filling up his coffee without even really looking at her, just telling her that he's about to do that. And she's, yeah. she does the office take to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so she imprisoned this woman. So I guess she deserves a lot of it. But I but guess, him, but, but tasting the the muddy drops of rancid rascality. I mean, uh, which, by the way, can we get into her writing a little bit? Because after that, uh, flung their muddy drops of ras- rancid rascality in the face of dogmatic dread. Mm-hmm. Don't really have a picture of what dogmatic dread is, <laughs> and then takes quite a turn until crushed beneath their constant clash, she yielded her paltry right to him whose order must never be disobeyed. So the muddy drops are now crushing their constant clash. <laughs> <laughs> she takes I, 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 metaphors I just, like you know stretches them like taffy at this point at, at this point in the book. There's some great well, ones anyways, later. Yeah, something was crushed by muddy drops of rancid rascality. So. <laughs> But Pretty so good. that's that's her description of uh, Rachel Hyde. But what about Tom Hepworth, the dismissed footman? He, oh, my gosh. <laughs> he was the very soul of honor and was highly respected by all who knew him. In his, every, in his presence, every care vanished like snow in sunshine. He acted as a father and friend on all occasions where trouble reigned supreme and never failed to hear the light laugh of youth. Proceed from its hidden bed where it too often reposed untouched. Okay, that last one's a little weird. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that hmm. means. Yeah. <laughs> Youths laughing in hidden beds and he's got his ear to the door. I'm, okay, but uh, before that, Tom Hepworth was just a prince of a man and, and dismissed unfairly and too soon. I, I'm trying to picture what she's getting at. Is there a, is there a Dickens character or something? Who's just an absolute saint of a human, you know, hat in hand, always just sort of like, I'd be happy to do that, <laughs> sir. Like, I don't know what she's going for. Yeah. But anyway. I don't know. Was, Maybe yes, it was like, you know, for, like for $200, you get your name in your book as a noble character. For 300 I'll put your ex in as this. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so, so amazing. Yeah I, yeah, I love Tom Hepworth. Um, but so he goes to live with Mrs. Durand, who is his sister. Um, Fanny Duran, sure. Fanny, yes. <laughs> but it doesn't last long, unfortunately, because a few months only elapsed whilst under her roof, he was seized with a fit of apoplexy, terminating in a few hours a life of usefulness. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, that's that's the last we hear of him, obviously. But then the shock of his sudden demise, of Tom Hepworth's sudden demise, when conveyed to his master, whom he revered, brought on a severe attack of hemorrhage under which Sir John Dunfern now lay prostrate. So that's extremely funny. 
people just handled bad news much worse in the olden days. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Like, this was, he was this, like, uh, robust bachelor right they talk about him being like he's a fisherman and a hunter and yeah you know he, he's tracking uh you know the rare heart across the wilderness and killing it with his bare hands and then like hey the guy i fired three <laughs> weeks ago who was <laughs> admittedly he was like 97 i'm surprised he lived that long yeah he died what oh, 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 oh god yes. no <laughs> He used to give me Werther. Yes. <laughs> yeah, to me it seems like he just dismissed uh, like the Harry Potter equivalent of Mary Smith, Maggie Smith and then like a kindly version of Filch from his house. And so that's what he's <laughs> that's what he's gotten so worked up about. <laughs> yes, that is true. If Filch, if you got word to... that Filch died, you probably wouldn't, you know, collapse onto your fainting couch and and suddenly have tuberculosis or something, but a kindly version, I think. But this guy has done this is he's got a habit of it, right? He's oh. had a lot of fits. There's a lot of, I mean, there's fainting couches everywhere. There's, mm-hmm. you know, people are just collapsing. Yeah. They're going to sanatoriums constantly. Well, he's ignoring his doctor's <laughs> advice to, you know, get a change of air or whatever that doctor right. was. His doctor comes in, says your condition is grave indeed. Yet again, get a change of air. You didn't listen last time. <laughs> uh, but I put wonder... the leeches on you. That's true. And, and when... Um... What's what's his name? The beloved uh, Tom Hepworth. Tom Hepworth. (laughs) So Tom was. It said something like very obscure, like he had almost run his race. You know, even when he was dismissed. Okay. So, you know, how old was he? I like how old are people living? Like, did he have fourteen fits, and so he was (laughs) thirty-seven? Right. Yes. (laughs) Just like looked like he was a hundred, or was he robust because of his? Obviously, his interior was so pure and and snowy white. Maybe he was a uh, you know one hundred and seven. Yeah, we look we make jokes about this all the time because whenever we do coronet shorts, I always in my mind those might as well be taking place in eighteen ninety seven. So <laughs> sure. So we'll make jokes, and people look much older, obviously. But we'll make jokes about how you know someone had reached their life expectancy by by fifty five or whatever. But I wonder what it was in in Ireland in eighteen ninety seven. Whether it was you know, 70 or whether you were still like, no, I made it to 85. I was doing okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I think if you, uh, you know, if you got over that hump of, you know, you didn't get gored by a bull or whatever, right, you could, yes. you could be okay. But usually like a rock fell on your head or something. <laughs> sure. Yes. That was how, that was how most of them went. Um, yes. But so uh, this is where she starts sort of talking about uh, Sir John in s- similar terms to Tom Hepworth. And, it's just hard to it's hard to square with you know him locking his wife up in a tower, but I think that just back then that was probably like his wife was his property, and to AMR this was just something that he you know was obligated to do. It was his right because she says the troubles that visit the just are many, and of these Sir John had ample share. So he she's just saying right there he is the just man. He is the book's moral compass here. That that's a tough one to to square. <laughs> <laughs> given what he's done i don't know how i don't know how she's making that turn but yeah i guess that's it's like look he had he had one fit of intemperance where he for what a year a, a year yeah. locked his locked his wife in a in a saw basement and <laughs> <laughs> and had had a stern taskmaster come in and have her crap in a bucket and <laughs> you know gave her gruel but you know that was just like come on all of us have little fits it, what do they call it in politics a youthful indiscretion sure you know? yeah <laughs> or like when you always read about like uh, you know a, a brewery in in California is uh, suing a brewery in New Hampshire because they both had a beer called you know uh, hop in the name of love Sure. And it's like, well, listen, like, hey, like, this is how trademark law works. We have to sue you. Otherwise, we lose that we, you know, they say we didn't protect the trademark. So it's like, I had to lock her up in the murder room. Otherwise, you know, they'll take my castle. That's just how it works being a lord. Right. And, and was I supposed to uh, lock her in, um, you know, a plushy room? Yeah. Like that. I mean, that was, uh, of all my rooms... People commented often on how great that room looked from the outside. Yes, so right. Yes, I was that, actually doing her a favor. That was the one they most wanted to have me unlock and show them to them. They could just sure. sense. Sure. But so this is so he's 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 taken to his fainting couch after he gets the horrible news about Tom Hepworth and. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, I'll just read it. There's a lot of buildup. How the misty dust blinded his sense of sight and drove through the field of fashion and feeble effeminacy, which he once never meant to tread, landing upon the slippery rock of smutty touch to wander into its hidden cavities of ancient fame, there to remain a blinded son of injustice and unparalleled wrong. All these thoughts seized the blighted protector of the late Colonel Idsley's orphan daughter and being gradually augmented by many others of private and public importance rose like a tumor of superfluous matter and burst asunder on receiving the last blow relative to poor old Tom Hepworth. Wow, that is some serious business. Next sentence. Sir John in a few weeks gradually grew stronger until finally he baffled his severe illness with Christian bravery. Whew! (laughs) Made it seem like something really big and important was going to happen there, but uh, just uh, sort of hand waves it away with that next sentence. I was going to say, like, yeah, I wasn't listening during that middle part. Could you read that again? (laughs) Yeah, he's fine. He's fine. He's all fine. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Uh, just, you know, inflate the, the balloon of drama only to burst it with the pinprick of, of bad writing. Although I think just a little bit later, um, let me see. I have, uh, uh, I have a couple dumb sentences clogging up my notes here, but I'll, I'll keep them for later. Mm -hmm. But doesn't he, uh, he doesn't actually conquer it with Christian bravery a little bit later. I think he's just sick again, right? (laughs) <laughs> well, he probably oh, oh, like wait, heard wait. that his horse came in third of the track or something, and that made him collapse. Uh, well, we get uh, we get his son um, Hugh. It, Hugh is six, so naturally he goes to high school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was delightful. That's <laughs> all children do. But while his, his six year old is at high school <laughs> under the the kind care of Professor Smith. Yep. Uh, A man of highest literary attainment. During those five years, Sir John was seen to gradually grow careless and despondent. The healthy glow of youth disappeared. What the hell happened to that Christian uh, bravery? Uh, it, you, you, it has to be like, you got to have a Potemkin society around him where everyone just smiles, like the Twilight Zone, smiles and says that everything's going great. Otherwise, he just might, you know, fall to his knees at any given moment. That does sound like that. Like, what? Come on, man. You were... We've described you before. You were John Cl- or George Clooney. You were running around pulling pranks on people, yeah. dating supermodels, yeah, going to you know like riding up on your horse to these parties and people going, "Ooh, Sir John," <laughs> and now he's like, "Oh, oh, my son." Yeah, he gets out of bed. I'm feeling pretty good today. The house is like nobody tell him about the Crimean War. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would that would be a big blow. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, so Hugh is six years old at high school, which sounds like a uh, a movie from the 80s or something. I guess it is literally a TV show from the 80s. It's Doogie Howser. Uh, sure. But uh, did you did you pick up on Hugh? Because I was like, oh, this is the first time they've identified him by his name. Not so. Oh, I didn't know. I, I just uh, assumed from context. But, when I, uh... when I uh, searched for it in the document, in the very first chapter, uh, the... It's describing a guy who I, in my mind, it was Sir John, but it says the entrance to this beautiful home of Sir Hugh Dunfern, the present owner, is planned on most antique principles. So the book starts, it flashes forward. It's all, this is all, um, we've seen the present and this is all told in the past because now Hugh has taken over uh, Castle Dunfern. That's, we tried to puzzle that out last yeah, time. Yeah. Or maybe the first episode where, wait, what? Who's yeah. that? So she's working wow. on, a couple, on, a, on a bigger level. She's playing 4D chess here. Holy cow. <laughs> well, hats off <laughs> to yeah, her. Yeah. But yeah, right now he's just a, a cheerful, intelligent boy, obviously, because he's gone off to high school. And the book just really messes with time here because he, he goes from one to six and then uh, pretty much the next paragraph, he's sending him to boarding school in Canterbury for five years. So he's now 11. Right. <laughs> and yeah, the, and... the, the added, uh, he's careless and despondent, but it also says the healthy glow, this is Sir John, of youth disappeared daily since domestic affliction entered his home and wrote its living lines of disgust with steady hand on the brow, which was now thickly marked with them. So he's just turning into like, you know, Jeff Dunham's old man puppet or something. Yeah, he's uh, he's getting the uh, Orson Welles age makeup in Citizen <laughs> Kane, you yeah. know, where it's just like yeah. the hair is disappearing under the bald cap. And uh, yeah, he's he's looking bad. I would have said he's Johnny like Knoxville Mr. and Jackass, but that's sure, pretty, pretty sure. much the same guy same. probably did those two makeups. But he goes, so when he sends him to high school, 
which, I mean, again, why can't the whole book be about that? Oh, my you know, God. Guys in letter jackets shoving him into lockers. Shoving him into lockers, yes. Take, pulling up his underwear and putting it over the locker door. Jokingly electing him prom king. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's played but by no. uh, by young Jonathan Lipnicki, of course. <laughs> of, I mean, of course. <laughs> um, that he, he goes each week to see him, but mostly... He goes to instruct uh, Professor Smith mm-hmm. that no one is to come in and see the boy. Yes. So like, and and which apparently is something you can do. So I guess they have tight security <laughs> at Canterbury High School where no one can come in and go like, "Hey, kid," you know. So, uh, but he he follows that to the letter. So I'm yeah. just wondering is is. Uh, is Sir John like handing him like packets like and uh, hey do me a favor buddy and you know slipping mm-hmm. the twenty dollar bill into Professor Smith's hand sideways like make sure uh, no chicks or uh, dudes uh, you know come around Talk my about kid and start sniffing around about my mom yeah he's like I will take this this is really no one has tried to do this I've not had to run any security um, like is Sir John thinking that people are going to do like a Truman show. Where McGruff, the crime dog, comes in to speak to everybody, but then he he takes off his dog head and he's like, "Hugh, Hugh, your mom is living in New York with her tutor," yeah. and they have to drag him out. <laughs> right? What was that? Nothing. Nothing. Maybe he must have been on drugs, which is why it's important to stay off of them. Professor Smith is, uh, you know, he's like, "Look, uh, no one comes here. This is literally six hundred miles away from uh, Howden Estate, yeah, and uh, breakers are crashing against the rocks." <laughs> yeah. So I just like that we have no idea where Canterbury High School is, where <laughs> where he's coming to, what it's like. But anyway, he gets a good education. Hugh does. And then he goes off to college, which I guess is different than the boarding school, correct? I think so. Okay. Yeah. I, I was going to mention, by the way, I, I was in college when I was uh, 16. I, I, don't re- I, well, I don't recommend it. Wow. It's, not a, it's not a good thing. It's not like I was smart or anything. So we could have smart. Jonathan Lipnicki playing you in the, uh, in the yes. Mike Nelson story, the made-for-TV movie. It was for movie. other I'm just saying it's not a good idea. And <laughs> so to be in high school at six, it, I just don't <laughs> recommend it to anyone out there. <laughs> yeah, people. But, there's always a story like that every couple of years where someone is, uh, has just gotten their, their PhD or whatever at the age of 12. And it's always portrayed as heartwarming as opposed to just like, Deeply insane. Yes. <laughs> Essentially child abuse. <laughs> uh, but even while he's... So he's gone, but Hugh has enormous affection for his dad. And he's... So he comes for the homecoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Hugh ran proud and, and proudly embraced him, who in return stood face to face with the very image of her whom he could never again own. So there you go. Oh, yep. Uh-huh. But Property. then it describes him, Hugh, rounded forehead, aquiline nose, hazel eyes, nut brown hair, ruby lips, oh. pearly teeth, the dimpled cheeks, and tiny chin of his mother. Oh, dear. So, uh, you know, again, artists out there. <laughs> yeah, please. please. get on that. <laughs> I mean, uh, I yeah. have to just imagine, you know, the, the golden curls like little bo peep the boater hat huge lollipop just like oh father it is delightful to join you here (laughs) oh father yes yes that's amazing i enjoyed that when he went off to college uh, we've left behind professor Smythe or whatever but uh sir john is a personal friend of professor o'sullivan and so Sir John calls in a favor. He's, he says he would prefer his son to reside with him, <laughs> which is a yes. pretty big ask for anyone. He's like, hey, my kid's going off to college. Oh, that's great. Like, yeah, maybe I'll have him over for, uh, for, for, for dinner like one of those times. I'll see if he, you know, college kids always like it when someone takes them out to dinner because they're always poor. No, no, no. I, I, was, I was wondering if he could live with you. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm, the, I'm the college president. I, well, <laughs> that's, I mean, man, like. Yeah, we were we were buddies in high school, but you know, we haven't spent that much time together recently. This is not. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to ask my wife. You know, she's pretty particular about these things. <laughs> uh, why don't I get her on? I'm gonna get her on the horn right now. You Hello? Fake phone call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think that would be good. I, I I'm allergic to young boys' clothing. I'm allergic to those big lollipops. They're always licking. But but dear, I would love to do it. Oh, this, uh, I, no, I'm just uh. I'm as I'm as heartless a bitch as that uh, Sir Rachel, Mrs. Rachel Hyde. I'm like her uh, if, you're, if you're aware of her. I sure am. She's known the 
County wide. Well, I all would, right. I would inflict uh, too much petticoat power on that boy I, if he were to be here. We can't have that. <laughs> well, I mean, you heard it. Yeah, um, I mean, hey, I know how it is, uh, man. I know. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, that leads to uh, uh, quite a quite a thing that uh, I had to I had to dive to the dark web for this. Oh, the what now? Uh, dark dark web. Oh, got it. Got it. I thought you said uh, dork web. No, dark web. That's where uh, if you were looking for a rig, hell of a or otherwise, uh, you might want to go there. Very nice. Um, it is this paragraph that <laughs> that got to me. The interview between Sir John and his attached friend, Dr. O'Sullivan, was affecting in the extreme. <laughs> so much so that Hugh, being an entire stranger to such outbursts of grief... And not being prepared for such sudden emotional and silent greeting as that now witnessed by him began to feel Im- an impossible to refrain from joining in their sorrow. Wow. So w- one second they're eating walnuts and drinking port. <laughs> yes. The next all hell breaks loose. And I just had to see how this played out. And oh, absolutely. Sure. I mean, first time Hugh pair- sees these. Yeah. Bursts, yeah, bursts of grief. This paragraph was well covered by reenactors on the dark web. Uh, I got my pick of them, uh, but then I downloaded them, and then my hard drive crashed. So oh, I dear. hired the yeah. So I hired the the players oh, oh. because the hard drive was I don't know. I plugged it back in later, and it did work. But anyway, it was too late. So I had already that, hired the hard drive restoration. Uh, Hard drives have never been cheaper. To restore it probably would have been like two hundred bucks. You could have. What, what? What am I supposed to do? Download it again? The the uh, I'm. I think I'm throttled at this no, point. No, your, my... uh, your bandwidth is like unlimited. Whatever nah. their cap is, you're not going to use it. Just they're so I'm, expensive. I'm bumping up against they're the cap. So, the players are so expensive, and it just. But anyway, I don't know. Quality increase. I oh. gave them a blank check, and we got this. The following a reenactment. Of the meeting between okay. uh, Doctor O'Sullivan, uh, Hugh, and uh, his father, Sir John. So let's, let's roll give it. That a listen. Ah, oh, my dear friend, Sir John, the countenance of care that now my orbs of vision behold cannot fail to impress upon my soul of friendship the dreary darkness of your departed dependency. <laughs> Companion of comfort, cannot but fail to not apprehend with cloudy compassion your continued comportment. Oh. What the? Why are you guys talking like this? Son, son, please. So, Sir John. <clears throat> Seriously, who are you? It cannot be conveyed. The beastly burden that... Please. Please. Dear friend. There, there. <laughs> Stiff up a lip. <laughs> Gentlemen, please, this is quite untoward. I've never seen its like, and I went to high school when I was six years old. Dad, Dr. Sullivan, come on, get it together. Does this have something to do with that footman I barely remember as a toddler? Guys, come on! I, uh, uh, <laughs> Son, you don't even know why we're crying. Why are you joining in? I think it is a bit impossible to refrain from joining in tomorrow. Okay, Dad, I'm all right with you. Yeah, but that's fair. Okay, so I mean, he was—he was deeply affected by. 
you know, I, I sometimes lash out uh, just just the thought of you know eating beans and rice for a month because of your blank check scheme. But they're all they're worth it. They get the it job is. done. Thank yep. you, thank you. Yes, I think so too, and I'm glad we've both arrived at that. Mm. So I will continue to pay them. Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> um, well, the uh, as soon as that dinner was over, I believe this is what happened. The uh, the president and Sir John retired to a room of seclusion, and the intense relief it gave the trodden and blighted messenger of manhood to, <laughs> Whoa. to at least have a friend who he could confide in. No one could half imagine. Yeah, that was a that gave me pause. That's uh, you know they've both been lonely, I guess, but. Uh, that's what happens in those in those rooms after the walnuts are gone, I guess. The blighted messenger of manhood comes out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so give me a picture of this. They they have a meeting. In, where did they have the meeting where they all, their grief so overwhelmed Hugh that he joined in their grief? Was that like in the kitchen while the people were trying to make mashed potatoes? <laughs> and, and then they retired to... Right. A cozy room of seclusion. Yeah, after that scene we just listened to was done, that was when they were like, you know, that was awkward. That we, uh, <laughs> yeah. The, the staff is like, I, I'll just wait here with the, uh, my, I do have a souffle in the oven, but uh, you're standing by the oven, so I'll just wait. And, or maybe uh, maybe the chef was was tolerant of everything, but then once the blighted messengers of manhood came out, you're like, all right, will you take this upstairs? <laughs> take that into a room of seclusion. My God, come on now. Um, go Go retire there. But what she actually describes as happening up there is it says, For fully five hours, both sat talking confidentially to each other and sympathizing when necessary. So that is essentially, that counts as a Amanda McKittrick Ross action scene. <laughs> five hours of, of confidential silent talk. Wow. And sympathy when necessary. <laughs> well, once again, uh, our bad books always, they, they include the time when there really is no, you know, there's no reason to give us a specific time. Right. Yes, exactly. For quite some time, they sat talking confidently. And then in your own mind, like, how long would two guys sit talking confidentially, confidentially to each other? Well, certainly not five hours. Insane. Yeah. I thought there's another one later, I think. But if, if, we, were to have, if we were to have done those as, a, uh, as, as one of our patented, if this played out in the real time, it's described to have sketches. That would be uh, it. Would be an, uh, uh, <laughs> that'd be the, the John Cage version of it. Andy Warhol uh, sleep. Yes. So that I don't have anything else. I, I was amused by um, the solicitors Hutchinson and Harper, but mm-hmm. uh, that that was just a, a name that struck out. I don't think they're ever mentioned again. <laughs> Why would they be? That was part of a uh, insane, insane uh, tortured metaphor. Uh, President O'Sullivan, whose well-guided words and fatherly advice had on this evening so sealed the mind of forgiveness with the wax of disinterested intent that Sir John, on his arrival home, at once sent for his solicitors, uh, Hutchinson and Harper, ordering his will to be produced, demanded there and then that the pen of persuasion be dipped into the ink of revenge and (laughs) spread thickly along the paragraph of blood-related charity, eh, a little off the rails, to blank the intolerable words that referred to the woman he was now convinced, beyond doubt, had braved the bridge of bigamy. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, so that's just uh, wedging them all in right there. And it oh, says, you're 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 strapping an analogy to the table and just like cutting it a thousand <laughs> yes. times. It's scream. You're pulling out its teeth. And it, yeah, ah! you've got one of those James Bond lasers approaching its crotch. <laughs> uh, but this, so that's what he he was informed by uh, O'Sullivan that Irene had married Oscar, and that's why he he comes in and and does that to his to his will. But it says uh, uh, before that, until now, the forgiving husband. The meek advisor, the patient sufferer, the wounded knight, <laughs> the once what? attached partner, the loving father, the son of gr- justice, gratitude, and chastity. And I said he did lock her up in a tower for a year. There was a there was a a toilet bucket. So let's you know let's just <laughs> dial back the wounded knight at least. The provider of bucket. The, <laughs> the cracker wow. of walnuts. Yes. <laughs> Oh, wow. All right. Well, that is uh, quite a chapter. Yeah. Chapter 16 uh, throws it uh, across the ocean to New York, where uh, what where it sort of starts is it just essentially says that Irene and Oscar are just are, are, are poor as hell these days. They are just, you know, paupers um, in, a, in a dingy 
you know, hovel eating uh, roaches and, and just scraping by. Shandon Cottage? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, maybe. Is that that's, a, that's the name of their home? Yeah, I love that all the homes get names, and then <laughs> when they're brought up again, like six tortured chapters later, you're like, what? Right. What are they? What is she talking about? And they're like, oh, Shandon Cottage. <laughs> <laughs> the Little House of Oscar Otwell. Nice. Where he took up residence. Yeah. Yeah. So... <sighs> I had a lot of trouble understanding, you know, how he got so poor, what poor is, you know, what the, you know, value of, of money, you know, in today's dollars would be. Because it says that Oscar thought that the, he got $1,000 from the, quote, underhanded sale of Audley Hall, his, his uncle's house, I think. He thought that meant he was a man of wealth for life. And I just, I don't know what a thousand bucks is, but it does seem like, you know, Selling one house and then moving to another one across the entire ocean, you know, might put a dent into that, I guess. But it says, when safely settled in his trim little college, Shandon Cottage, please, squandered his trifle in a very short time. And it doesn't really tell us how, but those are the details that I want to know. Yeah, squandered his trifle. So, huh. at one sense, he's like, this is, I, I mean, we are, we're rich as Croesus. Yes. We have a thousand pounds. <laughs> And then, uh, whoops, I spent it. I, um, I played three games of cards and I bought <laughs> some uh, gum. Yeah, right. So we're, we're <laughs> so sorry, you know, moths flying out of the pockets, yeah. pockets turned out. Wearing a barrel. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> what, what did he not get about this? Right. Well, then, so then it has this, though. So this is what really threw me. It says, it was only when Oscar was forced to evade starvation that he deemed it imperative to accept an appointment in public school at the yearly income of $1,000. So he thought he was set for life a few lines earlier because he had got $1,000. And it's like, so it's like, I was like, so if, if someone gave me $5 million, I'd be like, well, there we go, I'm set for life. And then if I somehow, you know, squandered that all on Dogecoin and, and horse racing, and then I was like, well, I was forced to then accept a, a job that paid me $5 million a year. It's like, I, I'd be okay with me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> having to get it over the course of a year as opposed to just at a one-time lump sum. Yeah, the, the numbers don't add up. Neither does the character of uh, OO mm -hmm. because – so at one second, we're, we're seeing the, the other end of his flowery notes to this, his beloved. Yeah. And, you know, he's coming across as like – you know, he's a, he's an RA at the college, and so, you know, he's upstanding. He's fine, fine Christian leader of youth or whatever, mm -hmm. writing these nice letters. Um, my dearest, if ever we should be together, and uh, my heart dare not think such a hope, you know. And then the next minute is like, I'll get a goddamn job when I feel like it, <laughs> you yeah, whore. Right, yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm not starving. Like, you might be starving, but I'm eating well. <laughs> <laughs> I kept a little bit of that thousand bucks. I got some cliff bars out. In the, you don't know where they are. Oh, Oscar. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. Then he slides a note under her door. My darling Irene. I mean, my darling Irene. <laughs> if When the wind whispers, <laughs> it does call it your name. Calls even your name constantly. Even me. as they had to shoot the horse that was the back leg of my trifecta. <laughs> and then uh, enters a room with a wife beater and a half empty <laughs> bottle of bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he does it's he, he gets fired from the from the public school which i think she specifies public school as like a oh dear we all know what that means like right but it says that he got fired uh, on the night of his open to missile from wake town public school i'm glad they specified and arousing his wife from sleep arousing from sleep his wife with monster oaths inflicted upon her strokes of abuse which time could never efface so that's pretty grim and I think it says he was fired, it just says because of intemperance. So he is, yes. he's just getting hammered and presumably, you know, coming to school or, or drinking on the job drunk. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Enough that he, that, yes, that he had to get fired. I mean, that's, you would think that would be pretty bad at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Just trying to, trying to teach people that. <laughs> This is a numerator, denominator. I don't give a damn which is on the top and the bottom. I mean, you know, when I was like, my wife was a Sir John. I bet she was on the top. That's what I got to, you know, but you <laughs> kids, guess, go to recess. I don't care. Uh, Mr. Otwell, what? sir. Yeah, what the hell do you want, Timmy? Uh, the, the quadratic equation, how does it work again? Yeah. 
You're going to learn that in a public school? No, you just go and go dig a ditch when you get out of here, Timmy. Put down that lollipop you're always licking. What the hell is that all about? <laughs> oh, mister. Your oh, curls well. make you look like a girl. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know who I am, Ms. Marjorie. Otwell? Marjorie had I'd, a rack. Yeah. I'd like to have a word with you, Otwell. <laughs> I'll see you in my office promptly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, so he is fired. Yeah, he does, of course. And uh, then goes home and I, it, it says uh, monster O's. It says strokes of abuse. So I, I, I assume that so, yes. is, you know, actual yes. physical abuse. So this is, this is grim stuff, but this is the reaction to it. Okay. Next morning, mended matters little for Oscar Otwell's wife. I suppose not. We don't know how hurt she was. Still raging with drunken horror, <laughs> he lavished upon her torrents of insinuations, which she found impossible to overlook, and which forced her to take refuge in the house of the Reverend Bert- Bertram Edgar nearby. Nice. I do have to say, raging drunken horrors are often impossible to overlook. <laughs> As someone is currently doing this to you. Sure. Yeah. Chairs hitting the wall, dishes pound near your head, screams of just abuse and horror. Like, you know, I can't ignore this. Bygones, yeah. Under the rug. (laughs) So she goes to, uh, what was his name? Bertram? Reverend Bertram. Reverend Bertram Edgar. Boy, that's tough. Reverend Bertram Edgar. I like that he's still he still manages to be drunk and angry like as the night goes. So he did, did he just like uh, you know sit back and and drunkenly read leaves of grass all night until she woke up again and then he just resumed his abuse. I mean, was he out there breaking dishes and stuff all night long? I don't know. Did she you know like I hate to be grim about like hide in the bathroom and like you know the bandages on and stuff and then like comes out like are you still at this yeah, that's right come on you're trying to pick up the tv and throw it out the window you're going to throw out your back yes. uh yeah i don't i mean the the all night uh drunk thing is a hard thing to imagine people usually end up nodding off and stuff so you know kudos to oscar for being able to pull that off that's some that's some uh, power move right there uh, I mean, I suppose he had he maybe he had a handle uh, of uh, <laughs> right. a bourbon that he just carried with him. That that's why the school was like, "Look, we can no longer ignore the fact." Yeah, really. That you don't just have a flask, sir. You carry around a a full handle. Yeah, of, the science uh, teacher is you know, he's, he keeps it he keeps it in his desk drawer, but you're not even attempting yeah. to do that. <laughs> put put it in uh, you know one of those coffee thermoses and uh, at lunch. That's how we do it around here. You sir. make the children kiss your handle of bourbon as they go up to the blackboard to write equations. It's not appropriate. <laughs> it's um, but yeah. So uh, she moves out into the reverend's house. And then uh, things escalate very quickly, as they tend to do in this book, because Oscar does not handle that well, as you'd expect. A few weeks later, found him in utter destitution, which, you know, from, from where they were, which was accepting jobs out of starvation and drinking on the job, it's hard to imagine how it got worse. Well, he, uh, even bigger insult, so she goes away, he sells all of their household effects, <laughs> which Oscar pocketed for their dainty worth. Nice. Okay. So I'm trying to picture the Shandon Cottage. What has he got in there? Yeah, like, I'm picturing like, you know, uh, Lenny's House of the Simpsons when the wall falls down and he's just eating it out of a can with a spoon. <laughs> like, I mean, what, how did they sold already before he accepted the, the pauper's work at a public school? So he's, I guess, out in his front yard with his stuff um, <laughs> and his, you know, his trusty handle yeah. of uh, no early, early birds. Times. <laughs> and he's uh, like, I got a, a footstool. They didn't give me anything for it. Give me anything for it. I don't need a footstool, yeah. you drunken idiot. Come on, ten cents. I got an electric cents. football table. Your kid will love it. Look, come on. I, do, I don't need one. Please, Beanie Babies. Like I hold, I'll sell them by the pound. <laughs> Uh, I'm your neighbor. I heard you uh, screaming at yeah, your wife. Is she okay? Night. That's I'm why I'm here to check on her. Yes. She's fine. She's with Reverend Bertram. Bertram, what's his? He got two first up, names. <laughs> shut up and buy my uh, Sports Illustrated phone that I got for free. Oh, the football phone. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> okay. Oh, I can't I'm wait a- for phones to be invented. Then I'll plug it in and call the next guy who gets one. <laughs> I'm gonna pocket their paltry worth. <laughs> <laughs> 
but so he decides uh, in a moment of madness, he resolves to resign himself to that ever anxious defender of satanic rights who prowls about in ambush. <laughs> so th- I thought that meant he was going to sell his soul. Right, like, I, I assumed that too. But it, it just seems to me that he's going to go drown himself in Afton Lake. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's the the second thing you think of when someone is going to uh, resign himself to the ever anxious defender of satanic rights. <laughs> um, so and- he ha- he heads to, and there's a curious thing about as he goes to uh, uh, bathe his body of perilous adventure in its darkened waters of deepest death. Uh, he sheds his Oscar Otwell divested himself of his scanty attire. Ooh. What was he wearing? Yeah, Borat's bathing suit? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Chip and Dale I mean, uh, little tuxedo shirt. I guess we're supposed to picture like uh, hobo half gloves yes, and you torn, know a tattered, a tattered and, sweater and yeah. stuff. <laughs> so that that went down Everything went down very quickly for him. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, you know, gets a job as a respectable salary at a at a school and quickly drinks it away, and then just like his clothes disintegrate. I mean, I, you you think you, yeah, you th- you think old timey clothes maybe they didn't last long, but people used to put some care into what they were making. You know, we had a we had honorable workmanship, so you would hope they wouldn't just disintegrate on him. Sure, but <laughs> scanty attire. He says a tearful farewell to his bindle as he lays it on the ground. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it says, in another moment, he was struggling in the freezing element, which soon should shroud his future with robe of blackest doubt. Mm. But enough of that. Let's introduce another character. Dunraven Hall was situated only a mile from Afton Lake and inhibited by the Honorable Eric Eustace, a nobleman of unbounded wealth whose extension of charity was both wide and varied. In this family that Mrs. Otwell was fortunate enough in securing the position. So that we, we know that means she got a job there as the you know, as a housekeeper or a cook in Eric Eustace's house. And that was the last we heard of of Oscar Otwell until um well, I guess it says that he she says that he resigned his worldly career, which was a pretty uh, flowery euphemism. Yeah, so that's the end of him. But uh, you know, we Eric Eustace gets described described as a nobleman of unbounded wealth what we didn't see was him uh buying and selling dilworth uh property over <laughs> inflating its value selling it to lords and ladies <laughs> yes. uh, that like yeah you know i made a cool billion off that sale of otley hall um sure i'll give uh one percent of it to the poor and, yeah uh, he's just flipping houses flipping estates he's just an absentee yes. landlord Evicting people. (laughs) Yeah, considering what you said about Sir John, you know, the the wounded knights, uh, calling someone a nobleman of unbounded wealth is a uh, extension, extending charity wide and varied is, you know, probably a bad thing. Yeah, he's got like six wives in murdered (laughs) dungeons all over. (laughs) But he's a nobleman. But Irene uh, wakes up one morning and has a sense that something as bad has happened. So she goes for a walk and uh, runs into someone who says, uh, oh, madam, the clothing of a gentleman was seen early this morning as David Gillespie, a laborer, was engaged at a drain hard by. <laughs> <laughs> and of all the people you didn't need to name, the uh, the guy who discovered Oswald, Oscar's frozen corpse, uh, naked corpse, was probably probably right up there. Right. <laughs> But she says uh, uh, it was neatly folded and deposited. Oh, she found his clothing. Sorry. It was folded and deposited on the brink. Surely someone must have been demented and drowned himself in Afton Lake. The authorities are now on the spot and refuse to mention who the gentleman is. But she has a bad, Irene has a bad feeling and like runs home and, and, and awaits the police to come and talk to her. And this is a, a great thing because so she, she suspects this already. Uh, the, the, Authorities come and drawing from his pocket a parcel containing Oscar's card, photo, and a letter addressed to Mrs. Oscar Otwell. The officer in charge asked her to read it aloud, <laughs> which she did in a rather trembling voice. <laughs> you don't, you don't say. Kind, kind of unconventional. Like, uh, yeah, we uh, we pulled a uh, bloated white corpse out of the uh, lake. <laughs> oh! we think- Yep, I know that's tough news. We're pretty sure it's your husband. Oh my God! Oh no! Yes, Poor Oscar. I know this. I know this is quite a blow. Uh, everyone is reeling under this news. It was I'm... grim to look at his his eyes bulging out of his white oh! puffy face. You ever I'm seen fainting. Jaws? I'm fainting. Yes, I have. Of course. Why? Yes, yeah. When that 
body comes out and oh, scares God, Richard yes, Dreyfus. It's, it's a terribly terrifying it's scene. Ten times worse. I'm than fainting that. off this fainting couch onto a sub fainting couch, a trundle fainting couch. Yeah, that's why we have them stacked up in an array around the room. Yes. Now, um, uh, <gasps> we suspect that he obviously that he killed himself. <gasps> Pretty sure he did it because of you. <gasps> um, but let's check. Here's a note. Would you read that out loud to everyone here? Why don't we get the kitchen staff in here too? Do what now? Read it. Just read it aloud. We'll find out. It's probably nothing. My heart is pounding just in like, my chest. I'll... I can barely even uh, barely get you out of sentence. You know what it probably me. is? Is him? It's it's probably not even him who's dead, even though we're pretty sure it is. But it's probably just a note saying he's picking up some ham on the way home. So oh. why don't you read it out loud? Uh, my, my mouth is dry. I, 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 my my, my okay. fingers are tingling. I might be having it's, a heart attack. It's quite lengthy, so uh, please prepare yourself. Your your partner is just glaring at me as if he thinks I'm to blame for this. I, we're pretty sure you are, but let's just check it out. <laughs> but then she does. She and reads the whole thing. She reads out loud. multiple pages of the book, and I was just wondering, like, how far does the policeman get before he realizes he's made a huge mistake? Like, two paragraphs in, he's like, "Oh my god!" It goes on and on. Like, we got to just back out the door here. The, you know, the second in command is, of course, like looking at his phone, like a minute yeah. into this. <laughs> or just staring at his partner being like, I told you, I just was like, <laughs> yes. why? You didn't... <laughs> he could have read it first and then just kind of given her the high point. No, I mean, what? <laughs> but the uh, my main my main takeaway from this letter uh, was that you know, Oscar finally and you know nobly expresses his deep regret for wronging Sir John. He says, yes. feeling persuaded I have robbed that nobleman who now possibly is pining for separation from a world of shame and sorrow underneath the lordly roof of Dunfern Mansion. I am positively convinced under such dangling dishonor that never more can this world of sin extend to me the comfort in vain I have tried to seek. Cast yourself at the feet of him and beg his forgiveness who loved you with a love unspeakable. Amazing. Wow. Just a, uh, wow. an amazing double middle fingers on his, on his way out. <laughs> uh, P.S. I can't find the salt, you bitch. Where did <laughs> right. you put it? Right. This is your fault. Your fault. <laughs> you know, Oscar also, you know who else got a bad rap? That Hitler guy. Go cast your feet at, uh, yourself at his feet, too. Beg his forgiveness. Right. <laughs> the guy who imprisoned you and Hitler. Uh, so I did wonder after reading that. When did he sit down and write that? Uh, uh, like on a on a sawed off stump with a little stub of pencil that he stole from a golf cart, <laughs> or you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, you know his ribs sticking out from starvation. Uh, you know, he drinking pond water to keep himself afloat to write this damn thing. Right, so and long. and also presumably hammered as he was too. Like, yeah, not just cobbling together the materials, but uh, you know, abusively drunk. Uh, beautiful though that it was uh, the same format that he used to like seduce her. Right. <laughs> yeah. Know? His Christmas letter. <laughs> Dobbs Ferry, Friday night, <laughs> dearest Irene, right. wife. <laughs> Goodbye forever, and then formatted perfectly from your affectionate Oscar. <laughs> he misspells Headley Burks. That's just that's how you can tell <laughs> yeah. he was distraught. Uh, but then the uh, the reaction I thought was pretty great too. Uh, of Irene folding the letter and handing it to the officers together with Oscar's card and photograph, all of which would prove indispensable for their future use. Absolutely no idea what that means. Mrs. Otwell quietly moved again to the breakfast room and strange to say, finished her meal in silence. So she just goes and sits down and just plows through the, the box of, of cocoa puffs, looking at the maze on the back of the box or something. <laughs> Peeling off the records that used to come on. <laughs> wow. I wish she hadn't but... sold her record player for uh, uh, you know, a half a <laughs> pint of gin. Oh, man. I would really love to listen to Sonny the Cuckoo uh, sing the Monster Mash. <laughs> that would be a great uh, a novelty record. Oh, one of the great things about it, though, in the middle of that is, uh, you know, she... It might have been slightly affecting had she just left this out, but the uh, move to the breakfast room and strange to say, finished her meal in silence. Yeah, that's just an odd. Like suddenly the author poking in, like, "Hey, I'm going to do this weird thing," but uh, you understand. Goodbye, author <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it is strange. I think it's a weird reaction just to get up from there. And uh, but then again, the police did just do something infinitely stranger that got no comment from AMR here. So let's settle down with your interjections. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this letter. Like, I, the, I'm, I'm with the, I read uh, 
I'm in a reading group with some guys, and we read out loud. Okay. And there are various levels of reading, and some guys read really slow. Huh. Um, and I sometimes I get impatient, like <laughs> I did when I was a kid. And I just wonder if uh, how was Irene's yeah. reading? Yeah. You know, did she rush through it, or was she kind of like, uh, should ever this reach your length? I trust you, you will. Will yes, we know. Pa- par- pardon. Part <laughs> me, me for the rash act I, I am about, about to commit. Yes, we get it, Irene. Co- the partner is just like uh, since <laughs> the mo- what? donuts are on yeah. you, man. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I just wondered, if, or did she just sort of? Go, I mean, and did she ever? There's no note of it here. It like quotes her reading the whole thing, right? Yeah, with no. So stage she never directions. stops and goes. Um, I mean, do you guys do you, do you want to sit down or should I keep? <laughs> is this? Yeah, you've got the you've like got my right down here. You <laughs> this next paragraph seems pretty superfluous. I could skip it. Like, no, nope, read it all, Miss. What? Come on, Come on man. I, as your partner, this is a terrible thing. What, what, what it all boils down to is probably how good her tutor was uh, about how how fast she's able to read. So, um, oh yeah, that's, that's the. Uh, it could yeah. be a. a a, a final indictment of his character and what, abilities. What or, an irony! Yeah, yep. the true what testament irony. that he 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 was the best there ever was, and this is a a sad fate to it that he met. Yes. Uh, well, so that means that she, once she's done with this, it sort of just things escalate quickly again, and says that she's going to sail back to England before they even bury him. I guess. Yes. And it says she's hoping to see her son, Hugh, who I think she gets word, or maybe the author just tells us is fifteen now. So that's how much time has passed. So he was know. 11. Okay, four years it took him to drink away their, their that's, fortune. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's how long he lived with Professor O'Sullivan in, uh, in, in, in college. But no, I think she left. I mean, she was in the room for a year. She got locked up when Hugh was two months old. She then left at, at one. And I think they, they moved out of Afton Hall pretty quickly, uh, selling it for ill-gotten means. So I think, I think they've been in America for, you know, uh, I would, you know at a, it could be 13 years. Oh, okay. So that's the the timeline that I was unsure of was how long they they lingered before the uh, shady sale of, yes. of the hall. Right. Okay. Uh, I imagine if you're doing a shady sale of a hall, your uncle has bequeathed to you, even though we neither of us understand what was shady about it, that you want to do it pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the construction now of these things that, of course, everyone when they were doing fanfic picked up on is getting out of hand. Um, <laughs> On approaching the harbor of New York, uh-huh. oh, come on, nice. to which she bowed, blinded in tears, and in as few words as possible, he related a short narrative concerning both himself and Lady Dilworth, who had long since been dead. Anyway, I like the combination of that, and <laughs> that's a great way to announce <laughs> someone's stepmother's death. It's just like, <laughs> right. You know, you kind of buried the lead there. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's just she runs into Lord John, Lord Dilworth, her adopted father, in the harbor by a coincidence, and it's given, yes. yeah, a couple sentences, one of which is, your mom is dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it really is just like a uh, a cartoon uh, thundercloud above someone's head when, when things are going poorly for them. Right. Uh, I had no picture of that guy. I wanted a little more story of him. Like, you know, after we sold... Uh, uh, you were gone. You were on your honeymoon. We didn't want to concern you, but uh, you remember I had three estates. Mm-hmm. Man, that was a nightmare selling it to Lord Eagleworth or whatever <laughs> the hell. That guy drove a hard bargain. I mean, imagine uh, anyway. Imagine if she had filled in the detail. It's like, yeah, you know, I had a uh, I had a ten year career as in minor league baseball. Anyway, your mom's dead. I got to get to the port authority to uh, to get these immigration papers in order. Uh, something like that great. would have just been, you know, made this the greatest book of all time. Yes. Uh, great to see you here in the harbor of New York. <laughs> yeah, we, we just call it New York Harbor. Yes. But, yeah, that so that, that uh, stunning coincidence and the last time she sees her father is sort of glossed over um, as she uh, head, heads back to her hometown at the end of this. Which, by the way, this being her adoptive father i'm still confused about the guy who lives in the place that was ill sold Hid- yes I- idsley I- oh with the guy who came to not colonel but like general idsley yes 
I'm still confused as to what the uh, major is what the relationship is there. But we'll, I guess, we'll get to that. I think Colonel Isley was her father, who was also maybe killed in some drunken brawl. That's why she got adopted. I, mean, I think he might have killed her, his wife too, and this might be oh. his brother or something. So that might be her uncle who uh, came to buy the hall or something like that. I, I, it has no bearing on anything, as it turns out. Right? No, of course not. I, oh, she okay. tries. Well, she tries to get some money from him at the end. Um, but we'll, we'll, of course, get to that. Uh, one more thing. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Oh, he's leaving. The father's leaving. Yes. He pathetically took his final farewell. I don't know what was pathetic about it. But <laughs> shortly after, was busy poring over his books in Franklin Street, office number 715, where he was employed as a clerk at $500 a year. Yeah. So a couple things to say about that. First of all, he was poring over his books, P-O-U-R-I-N-G. Nice. Which pedants will be enraged over, so I don't know what he was poring over his books. <laughs> the fact that they gave us the address and the office number mm-hmm. seems superfluous. And then he was employed as a clerk at $500 a year, so half the salary, getting very birdemic here, we get either $1,000 a year or $500 yeah. a year. And I guess he was pathetic at 500. You know, we're supposed to see him like, oh dear, you know, like I'm barely scraping by since our days, you know, when you were our adopted daughter. So long, got to go to work mm-hmm. at my pathetic job. He's Bob Cratchit. Yeah. So thousand bucks a year, not bad. Right. For Otwell, that dude squandered a pretty decent job, it sounds like. Yeah. He thought he was set for life at $1,000. So again, you know, $5 million. I'm set for life. Uh, someone hands you $2.5 million. Oh, my God. Uh, this wretched pauper's existence. <laughs> I, I'll snuff the candle out. Yes. It's not giving enough heat as it is. It's just, it's just a waste. Yes. Right. Oh, my. I'll have to fill the Ferrari with uh, regular instead of premium. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the, the end. Of, and then she uh, steams toward... Her home country. Yeah. So, which I was going to say, it is Ireland, correct? This is where <laughs> all of this. Is uh, happening. she's talking about uh, no earlier. They, uh, I, I gave the locations. Okay. Um, uh, is she from Ireland? Well, is it? Uh, and, uh... Let's see. Uh, blah, blah, blah. It gave an actual place somewhere. Okay. Cheshire. Okay. That's in England, right? Known for its cats. That's all I know. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think it's in England. Okay. Well, 17, chapter 17, flashes uh, back across the pond to Sir John. And uh, just based on what we've uh, experienced in the book so far, how characters react to, to you know, bad news or, or adverse conditions, how do you think he's doing? Is he thriving? He's volunteering, taking up pickleball? What do you think? Let me see if I can picture his face of youth. Is it rosy? <laughs> Or is it gaunt and hollow? He grew um, more drooped and heartless every year. And okay. seemed almost indifferent to life's plowing changes. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> At this point, it's like, you know, are there any bones left in your body? You're just drooping and etched with careworn lines and, and uh, you know, your, your ear hair uh, begins to take on the, the countenance of a dark, cloudy day. Like... I'm assuming he looks like one of the uh, characters that I draw wearing underpants. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just like face is just hanging down. He's got warts and moles with hairs growing out of him. It's <laughs> just terrible. Uh, they, but it does. The chapter starts with this, or it's very near the top. I think uh, I challenge anyone to make sense of this. The mighty orb of gladness spread its divine halo over many a harrowed home. It encircles the great expanse of foreign adventure and home-hoarded enterprise and wields its awakening influence against the burthened burrows of bigotry and lightened land of liberty to a sense of gilded surprise. God. I I literally have no <laughs> idea what that means. I can't even... Even knowing her style, I cannot twist that back into any kind of meaning at all. Yeah, I mean, I just... I, I, said, I assume it's the sun, but I, then I, I started lost. started puzzling, and then I got completely lost. Yeah, it's, so I, I don't know what it means. A good rule of thumb. I feel like Jim Tice did it as well, but you don't need to describe anything round as an orb. It's just yeah. you're, uh, you're on the wrong track as soon as you start going down that road. Right. <laughs> 
Well, uh, Sir John realizes that he's going to have to tell Hugh uh, about his mother at some point in time. Hugh is probably approaching his you know, doctorate or something at the age of 17. So he, he, he's going to have to let him know about their history, their family history. Um, and so Hugh comes back from, from college and he was nerved somewhat before entering the chamber of death. I guess he, he gets winded that his father's not doing well. So he enters yeah. the chamber of death with words of truth regarding his father's hopeless condition. And on moving quietly to his father's bed, how the lad of tender years was struck with awe at the bleached resemblance of what used to be a rosy, healthy father. <laughs> Wow. So he's just de- he's degrading like a guy who just took a sip out of the the wrong uh, holy grail at this point in time. He's a crypt keeper. And it, the reasons for it are I guess multifaceted, mostly that the guy he fired died. Tom the 90- Hepworth. Tom Hepworth, the 97-year-old guy that he fired died at 98, I guess. <laughs> Maybe just crawled over his 98th birthday. And upon hearing that news, like physically, what happens? Do you have any notion of like, does a blood vessel in his chest burst, and so he's just pumping out blood into his thoracic cavity, and, I, and so he's I, sick, I, and there's pus in there, and like, what is what is happening? I'm imagining a you know a cartoon mosquito, um, you know, sucks out his blood, and he just turns into sort of like a a, a peel, a husk of a guy. <sighs> So it's just, it's, he died of a broken heart. Yes, like, yeah, there you go. Mac. Okay. It's just so, I'm just trying to think of... Mal humors. <laughs> um, so he, uh, the, he calls the doctors then. Mm-hmm. And meeting the three most eminent London physicians, <laughs> if you thought we weren't going to get their names, oh, you are sorely oh, mistaken. Yes. Uh, doctors Killen, Crombie, and Smiley. Wow. Guys, they Smiley. held a long consultation. And I was just thinking, if if this has not been snapped up as a band name, uh, <laughs> Killing Crombie and Smiley, oh, and then man. just and then just wait for someone to come up and go, yeah, I know what you. Oh, that would be amazing. Uh, I get it, man. You're like, in the band uh, now. <laughs> yes. Oh, that would be so awesome. Yeah. When you like, uh, sometimes you 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 come across something like that where you you have had no idea something was a reference, and then you you either watch the movie. Um, or you, you, you discover it in a book, and it, it, it is a pretty awesome thing. And this would be the greatest thing in the world if that was some <laughs> prog rock group from the 70s, you know, selling out stadiums with their electronic rendition of, you know, Bach concertos or whatever. And then you discovered <laughs> yeah. it came from Irene Isley. Uh, yeah, so after, so the band leaves, and then, uh, I don't know if you have anything before it, but then we get... Like the greatest speech, I think, in any book. <laughs> yeah, I just want to I want to call attention to this before it happens. It says sure. that, uh, that the three doctors, it doesn't specify which of the doctors, you know, it says they're the three best doctors. What was the exact wording? Um, let me pull up uh, the band again. Uh, doctors. Oh, the most eminent okay. doctors, All London right. physicians. But so it doesn't say like who's number one, two or three in this group. So I wonder if there's any. It's true. They don't say. They don't say. Yeah. But it says, uh, perceiving his son's uh, bent and weeping form hang over him with meekest resignation, Sir John cast aside the bedclothes and extending his hand caught firm of his son's. Hugh spoke not a word by order of the doctors, all three of them, lest his father, who was now bereft of speech, would feel the pain of not being able to reply in return. So a lot to unpack here, but essentially what has happened is, is Sir John is, has d- digressed so badly that he cannot speak. Hugh comes in and the doctors are like, hey, uh, it's just <laughs> it's hard to imagine, but he's going to get even worse if you speak because it will pain him so much that he's not able to reply. So just walk in. You haven't seen him in months and just sit there and don't talk to him. <laughs> so Sir John can think, you know, he's, in a, he's sort of in locked in syndrome. Hugh sits there and Sir John is like, why the hell isn't this guy talking? What is what what is going on? And Hugh just sits there without replying at all. It's it's absolutely insane. It's not only insane, it lasts for six weeks. <laughs> so I don't know, are the doctors hanging around and they're you know, every time the sun comes and I assume he he came from London, right? Mm-hmm. Which I don't I don't know what he's doing there. I can't remember what oh, yeah. what he was Killing like, it, that's to, for sure. Going to school, yes. He's 
He is uh, what do you call it? Uh, rise and grind? Is that yeah, what he's yeah. Doing he's, there? yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, okay. he's a uh, he's a hustle bro culture guy. Yeah. Okay. He's the six hour work week or whatever. <laughs> okay. So he comes in because his his you know dad is like a sack of bones at this point, <laughs> and on day one they say like you know they give him the speech. Don't don't talk to him. Yeah. You know it'll really embarrass him. And then day two is like, How, how's it going? And it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. And then cut to week three. Like, guys, we yeah, have to, it's, like... It's getting to be performance to... art at this point in time. It's like that woman in the Met a couple of years ago who you could just go and look at, and she would just stare back at you, and people would weep. <laughs> so at week six, like, who's paying you guys? Right. Like, what... Is, what is... Uh, then uh, suddenly he regained speech partly. He probably just wants, you know, this madness to end, and that's uh, that was powerful yes. enough. I, he, he had to have thought like something awful has happened to my son and I can't express the words like I can't speak and it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. But clearly something terrible has happened to him, too. Right. So so he gets a new bottle of medicine, <laughs> which causes him to. OK, on entering the chamber of sickness. Damn it. Nice. Stop that. Yeah. One morning with a new bottle of medicine sent direct from London. Hmm, mm-hmm. Say, say. <laughs> Sir John raised himself slightly on his left elbow and made inquiry about his son. So wait, Sir John em- enters the chamber of sickness with a new bottle of medicine and then raises himself <laughs> slightly on his elbow and made inquiry about his son? Yeah, that's... How's... That's, what? Well, the diagramming is not her strong suit here. What do you think the inquiry uh, was? Like, Why the hell doesn't that little wiener talk? Yes, what, what is going what? on? Six weeks? Was that the shipping time from London for that medicine? Like, yeah, there's a medicine that you can speak, but... It doesn't even specify yeah. that he took it. Says so someone entered with it, and then he'd raise himself up. We're like, whoa, <laughs> man, I was out for a while. Oh, so then, uh, so yeah, he regains a little bit of speech. And so I guess they, you know, ring the alarm and Hugh comes in. Uh, you know, he was out playing jarts with like 13 <laughs> girls and, you know... <laughs> gin and tonics were being served right hang on i gotta go inside and not talk to my dad <laughs> uh so week six this this happens yeah. uh, and uh i, I want to kick amazing. it off with a sonic challenge oh please yeah. do taking so so hugh comes in and, and sir john is is gonna is finally talking again taking his son's hand in his sir john dunfern after audibly yet a little indistinctly Offering up a prayer of thanks. So it's okay. audible, but a little indistinctly. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is, and it's to, it says to him who never overlooks the words of the just. Yes. So, so once again, but, Sir John, potentially the some, jailer. Uh, yeah, some red, <laughs> some uh, asterisk above the just and then fine print yeah. like a car ad. Okay. I'll do uh, Sir John for Dunford and audibly yet a little indistinctly yes <laughs> indistinctly offering up a prayer of thanks to him who never over- okay here we go <clears throat> your hand feels so good to be able to speak your own your hand is le- much less bony than mine my son <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like to start by thanking your prayers thanks to him who has well, thank you for my speech which i have all right that you know, never overlooks that words of the I don't know I would qualify as that anyway thank you for this speech uh, now the word of that <laughs> where did you go <laughs> very good very audible and yet very a little uh, just a touch indistinct a little indistinct yeah okay good but that kicks off a as you said a stunning scene where he really makes up for lost time not having spoken for six weeks Oh, I don't know if a, a book has ever been fully restated by one of its dying characters My before. My God. I feel like it's happened that, in some of the movies we've done, right? Where there's like recaps of, hasn't that happened? Yeah, I guess, yeah. It's, sure, sure. Like flashbacks of things that just showing it again, not from any new perspective. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, and that's what this is. I don't think we get any... Maybe some little details that are different than the the book. Maybe, but otherwise, it pretty much just runs through. Fifteen paragraphs recapping the entire book to Hugh, uninterrupted. As you know, I guess Hugh is used to sitting there without saying anything. But this truly is 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 
just a stunning thing to imagine happening if it actually happens the way it's described here. I think if we were to record this as a dark web thing, or get the players to record it sure. as a dark web thing, and put it as an extra. Yeah. Uh, it, it would be like the Wizzo the Clown reading that I did on YouTube. <laughs> right, yeah. If you could get through this. The sound of someone descending into madness. All right, we'll take <laughs> the challenge. You, uh, then that would be quite, quite a thing because, uh, I don't know, is he taking a deep breath every time and like the sun is, Hugh is patting the, the bony skeleton hand and going, there, there, father, pass on. Uh, that's fine. You don't need, this is too much effort for you. You are aware of my son. Like, oh my God. Wow. Yeah. I mean, can we know. take, is there a medicine? Is there an opposite medicine? Um, <laughs> yeah. Call London, please. I mean, it's going to take weeks, but let's get it in the works now. Good Lord. There's not a ton there to single out. I did like the way that he describes her. Uh, he, you know, sort of like, what, Daddy, what was my mommy like? And he says, I cannot yes. help informing you. She was the most beautiful and prepossessing young lady I ever met. So that's, you know, that's, is that flattery, I guess? That paints quite a picture, Dad. <laughs> Thanks. Prepossessing. <laughs> uh, and then this is, uh, this is some, good, uh, some good weasel words, some good uh, mistakes were made type of thing. He says, I was therefore obliged through her malpractices, to shut her in the gaze of outsiders and also from my own. I chose room number 10 of this building as her confined apartment. So he's, he's, he's got a, a, a layout here of, of room numbers. Then he assumes that, uh, that Hugh is sort of on board with him. He's like he, like he would know what that means. I've I've been gone for quite a while. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> no, uh, also, it's like next uh, to the sitting room, you know. Uh, right. Also, he was obliged. Yeah. Through so like Oscar Otwell before he died, like you know, uh, sitting down with another drunkard on a park bench, like yeah, I was obliged to scream at her. And shit. <laughs> oh, of course. I mean, of course you had to. You were obliged. What yeah. could you do? What was obliging you? It was like the bro code? Is that what we're talking about here? Uh, but he does give uh, this great uh, picture of her to him, and then the comparison is pretty pretty nice. On returning home from Chitworth College, I at once blanked the reference to her in my will and never more wished to behold the face that swore to me such vows of villainy, the face that blasted my happiness for life, the mother of you, whom I now earnestly implore never to acknowledge, and who possesses every feature she outwardly bore. <laughs> She's a piece of garbage whore. You know, you look just like her. <laughs> really, Dad? That's, uh, hmm. I, I, I wish you hadn't started talking, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, yeah, we, uh, is, it, is it a compliment, you know, in this day and age to... You know, when men were men and type of thing to be like, yeah, you look just like that beautiful woman that your mom was. You're very prepossessing, oh, Hugh. Chestnut hair and those <laughs> rosy cheeks and tiny chin. <laughs> right. What's up with your tiny chin anyway? Yeah. And every feature too. Like, are we? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <I don't> know. <laughs> and so that is it was interesting to me too because it sort of says that uh, that he only struck her out of his will. After he got word that she had married Oscar from like the his buddy at the college. Before that, it says the dreadful news of her conduct irritated me so that I only in my last will and testament bequeathed to her what would grant the ordinary comforts of life provided I predeceased her. So after they escaped, he kept her in her will. He scaled it back. But only once she found out that he had married Oscar. That's what caused her to completely strike her. So he was he was being very reasonable even once she had fled his premises. I wonder, did he, I forget what his solicitors were, but I wonder if in his phone book, because he consulted them so often, was he accidentally calling the doctors when he meant to <laughs> yeah, call right. his solicitors? So like two guys would show up once and like, where's the third? Like, no, we're the lawyers. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. It had no, uh, no ranking of the solicitors estimable, esti estimableness. What is the word? <laughs> That's close enough. Sure. I mean, so did he just like, were they the type of guys that advertise on a, on a bus bench? They were just uh, ambulance chasers. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he, he spent so much on his doctors that he had to scrimp when it came to them. I guess so. <laughs> uh, but that's amazing. So he, uh, 
Uh, but it ends. I think you you wanted to, you liked the ending. I a lot. loved the ending. So I mean, yeah, so, I, again, yeah. fifteen uninterrupted paragraphs, and then when he's done, we get a moment that I you know I I laughed out loud because I thought it was legitimately hilarious, even if she didn't mean it to that to be that way. Sir John Dunfern now lay back, exhausted on his pillow, and muttered quietly. Oh, thank God. (laughs) (laughs) So he just gets that all out, just like, oh, like an old man grunt. Thank God. And then dies. He pretty much just like, that's his, that's his final word. That's his rosebud. He drops the snow globe. That's it for him, for our main character. (laughs) Oh, we get his death though. We get the nice, we get the touch of AMR. The next morning, the angel of death was seen to spread its snowy wings. Nice. So even in this, you couldn't just get, you know, Sir John died. You you have to get was seen to spread <laughs> its snowy wings. Right. Is that the passive voice or is that even like that you know, is the through exceedingly the, passive yeah, voice? It's a passive voice through a microscope. It's just. Yeah. Wow. Ah, so that's the end of uh, one of the greatest bachelors in uh, in all of literature, I think. Oh yeah, I mean you've got you've got Gatsby and and then Sir John. That's the uh, the, the most estimable of uh, of bachelors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, chapter eighteen, we got two more. Yeah, these are. I mean, they get. Well, this one's not shorter, but yeah, we will dive in. A lot happens, and it begins uh, in. I don't know if it's a joke or not, but. A lot of people pointed it out, the the way it starts. The night was dark and tempestuous. I have to tell you a strange coincidence. I went to a a friend's house and he said, what have you been up to? I said, I got to read this, the end of this uh, book. I described it. He's like, what in the name? (laughs) What are you doing? He goes, so what? I said, no, no, it's kind of famous. And he goes, oh, is it? uh, It was a dark and stormy night. Ah. And I, I said, yeah, I mean, I think, and I had yet to read that. Wow. I got home an hour later, and that I read it, and I sent him the text, and I sent him the picture of the page. Nice. He's like, holy moly. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. So I think that uh, was from like 50 years before this, or 60. So I don't know if it had its uh, reputation yet, if the Inklings were laughing it up about that one yet. So I, do you think this is a coincidence or her own little joke? Or if that's just a thing I, people used to say. I don't think it's a joke. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably... Why start she, now? <laughs> yeah. She heard it and just couldn't avoid it. It would be a weird... It's, it, it, it'd be a weird joke. It's like a, then she goes on to describe sure, the night. Yes, and everything, yeah. so. It's like a college student or a high school student sort of like rephrasing Wikipedia so it's not technically plagiarism. You know, putting it in your own words. Yeah, I think that I've probably said it on this podcast before that when I was young and was writing creative writing, I would always like someone awoke with a start because <laughs> I, I read that somewhere and thought, well, that's a good way to start a chapter, right? Yeah. Someone going, oh, I'm waking <laughs> up. And then you get to like your characters right in the middle of everything. So I did it. And a teacher was like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So I think maybe that's just the same thing. Like it sounds like something, you know, yeah. if it wasn't a cliche, it's not terrible right. because, you know, it's a dark night and it's stormy. Like that sets the stage. Sure, you could imagine quickly. some Shakespeare character saying something that's along those lines. Right, right. Uh, but amazing that she uses it here. <laughs> um, and then, so Irene uh, is back, back on the on the continent. I guess um, she or is she in England? I forget. It's England, right? Yes, she's back in England. Uh, she is wandering around, and she ends up at Tom Hepworth's sister's Fanny's house. <laughs> <laughs> this, this one, I, I, it took me a while to untangle. Yeah, I'd said you'd be wait, forgiven wait, wait. for throwing the book across the room at this point in time. <laughs> Fanny Durand. The, Fanny Durand, the aged sister of the late Tom Hepworth, and then... D- and this is in the, that same sentence. The twofold widowed wanderer with trembled step faltered to the door of uncertain refuge and tapping against it with fingers cold and stiff on such a night of howling wind and beating rain asked in weakened accents the woman who opened to her the door. Oh, my God. If she could be allowed to remain for the night, sentence not over, a request that was granted through charity alone. <laughs> Delightful. So through all of that, you're supposed to understand that she knocked on Fanny Hepworth's. <laughs> no, Fanny Durand, Mrs. Durand, Durand. 
the aged sister of the late Tom Hepworth. <laughs> she knocked on her window and uh, said, hey, can I stay for the night? And she doesn't seem to know who she is. She's just like, well, yeah. I guess on this night, anyone can stay. This is something that probably happened more often. It's just someone, you know, a traveler showing up at your door that you were, you know, deigned to extend charity to. Yes, and then you have a beloved footman who then gets to take care of her. So there's no, it's no skin off your ass. Like, yeah. Sure, I guess. I mean, when Mrs. Durand came back, I was just like, oh man, like at least, you know, novels like fantasy novels, Game of Thrones, they, they, when they throw people at you like this, they, they, they keep coming back up. If someone gets a name, you at least can tell that they're going to be, you know, part of the story as it keeps going. Um, mm-hmm. But this book, just, there's so many false ones thrown at you. The solicitors, the doctors, the castle purchasers that for her to come back uh, and play a part in this in, in the end game of the book was unacceptable. I, um, let me pull his name out here. Uh, Henry Hawks. Is that a name you're familiar with? Uh, Bruce Willis movie from the early 90s? No, he's the head gardener over at uh, oh, at the Marquis of whatever's place. <laughs> anyway, it just amused me that he got a full mention. And it's like, is is he coming back? Was he someone else? Like, nope. Uh, just a gardener's name. <laughs> yeah, but he could have. I mean, if Fanny Duran is coming back. you know, Yes, in, Fanny Duran is alternate back universe. big time. Uh, but I also enjoyed how... Now Irene is essentially just referred to as like the widow or the twice widowed. Like that's now her identity. It's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. I, now she's just kind of wandering around like Miss Havisham or something. Right. She's just like a ghost of a person. Mm-hmm. Like we're supposed to imagine, uh, you know, Bernard Herman music, like mournful stuff. And then black and white long shots of uh, like a lone figure wandering down alleys, yeah. you know, looking at, I guess. Yeah. Peering in through windows type of thing. Yeah, rubbing, you know, her half glove to uh, smear the frost off the window and look in at the picturesque scenes inside. (laughs) Uh, So she goes to, first of all, of course, Fanny Durance. And then a couple days later, which I I don't know if Fanny is like, "Um, how long were were you? Fanny's running Uh, the the vacuum like at all hours to try to give her a hint. Yes. But yeah, she stays there for uh, several days and then works at the Nerve to visit Dunfern Castle. And as she leaves, she tells Fanny Durand, hey, don't expect me for dinner, which I had, you know, Fanny Durand had the double middle fingers out as soon as the door slammed shut. Yeah. <laughs> expect this yes. for dinner. She also, it says, partaking of a very light breakfast, she told her not to expect her for dinner. So it's like, oh, so the, I'll put the milk away and the cereal and okay, <laughs> and, and I won't make you dinner. Okay. Got it. Yes. Man, <laughs> good riddance. Yeah, she deserves So everything. then she goes to, uh, this is another great, uh, marching down the hill's face, she soon set foot on the main road that led to Dunfern. So I guess we get a little picture. They're fairly close. Mm-hmm. And then we get this, which made me laugh out loud, being admitted by Nancy Bennett, <laughs> a, a prim old dame. <laughs> and again, Stop right now. Make the book about the prim old dame Nancy Bennett, and I'm a fan for life. Yep. But uh, but that's the only mention of Nancy Bennett. Yeah, Nancy and, and Fanny's wine night, like, you know, gossiping about yes. their dead husbands. That'd be amazing. Oh, my God. Yes, of course. But so uh, Nancy Bennett answers the door, but then I think the footman talks to her, like the, the whoever replaced uh, Tom Hepworth. Hepworth, yeah. And this, so I like this. She Irene asks where the you know, lord of the house is. And he says, Madam, if you cast your eyes thence, here the sturdy footman pointed to the family graveyard lying quite adjacent in which the offcast of effrontery had oftentimes trodden, you can with ease behold the rising symbol of death which the young nobleman, Sir Hugh Dunfern, has lavishly and unscrupulously erected to his fond memory. So I want to do that the next time a, uh, a person knocks on my door and says, Hey, I hate to bother you, but I'm doing your neighbor's uh, gutters, so I was wondering if you needed anything here, and I could just... Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, sir, you uh, say you are a gutter salesman. Yeah, I just so your neighbor's having him. So I, it's if cheap. you cast <laughs> your eyes thence, cast my eyes where you there Th- thence to the family graveyard. Oh yeah, it's, it's lying quite adjacent. I don't understand why you're having trouble seeing it. Oh well, I do power washing too. So if any of those need to be, uh... you can with ease behold the rising symbol of death. Which the young nobleman, so you Dunfern, has lavishly and unscrupulously erected 
to his fond memories are. And so I bid you good day. I got some meat in my car, too. That I don't need meat either. That's... <laughs> Yeah, it might deter him. You know, that might have an effect of that. Uh, especially, I wonder the the pointing where he points to the uh, graveyard quite adjacent. I hope that that was like a good, like ten seconds of like messing with his sleeve. You know, to get his arm freed up to point with his white glove. <laughs> he wasn't expecting to do it. I like looking at this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, it's right, uh, right over there. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I, I think the next time someone does do that, like, hey, your driveway's in bad shape, I'm going to be like, hey, let me get my footman. He's going uh, to handle this matter for me. Yes. <laughs> and it's quite a while. The guy's standing outside the open door as he hears, like, the other sounds of, like, Jerry, where did you put the, the vacuum cleaner, the one with the face on it that amuses me? Like, it's downstairs. <laughs> Come back dressed in pe- my footman's costume, obviously the same person he was talking to before. <laughs> Oh, that was good. But he goes to look at the tombstone then. Or, I'm sorry, Irene goes to look at the tombstone. I was uh, back still in our in our sketch there. And there is a... <laughs> I mean, what's normally in a tombstone? Just like, you know, name, years, maybe like one one thing, like uh, father and friend to all type of thing. I I can only assume that the this tombstone was like those, uh, you know, posters at a Spencer's gift or something <laughs> where it... There's they're propped. There's hinges on them, and you have to flip them or uh-huh. something. Yeah, because it's this the ABCs is amazing. Of, of drinking your freshman year in college type of thing. Like A is for alcohol, B is for the bathroom where you puke. Yeah, uh, what? How is this possible? It's a seven stanza poem carved into this tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I suppose it could just be a comically, uh, you know, it's like a Stonehenge rock. But they're also, the stanzas are labeled with numbers, too. Yes, yes. So what kind of real estate are we talking about here? I said that the, the stonemason's fee alone could have kept Oscar and bourbon for over a year. Right. It's amazing. And it's, you know, uh, I didn't take a lot away from the poem. It's, it's no, the poem's just pretty terrible. Trite garbage. It's garbage. I'll read a, yeah. one stanza of it, just the first one for people who are, who are playing along at home. The hand of death hath once more brought... The lifeless body here to lie until aroused with angel's voice, which calls it forth no more to die. So, I mean, it's terrible, but it's nothing. It's not super funny. Uh, yes, it's not funny. But I, I wondered in editing as you're, you know, the, uh, the again, the stonemason going like, you sure, uh, you know, chapter or uh, stanza six. Mm-hmm. Then when the glorious morn shall wake each member in this dust of ours to give to each the sentence sure of everlasting princely power, you're, you're going to stick with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, not a great rhyme, uh, but it, it's, it's slants. You know, that, it's, is, that is $180 alone, that one there. Uh, and the fact that I have to fit it in front of stanza seven is going to cost you another $285. So I just want to make sure before is there a, I lay chisel to stone. Is there like a cheaper font we can use? You know, the font is the font because they're, they're at, at this, we're really, we're talking like 12 point font mm-hmm. to get this on a tombstone. It's going to be hard to read. And that, I got to bring in a guy from London. That is six weeks. Well, can he bring sure. some medicine with him when he comes? I don't, I'm not aware of that. I'd have to well, call. Well, yeah, this is not good. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to sell Blanford Hall, uh, take out another mortgage on it. This is, uh, but this, well, is, you, this you, is his dying wish, you know, and I couldn't say no because the doctors advised me not to speak to him. So he said, I, I want to. Seven stands a poem and 12-point font on my tombstone, and I had to sit there and be like, this okay. is going to ruin the family, but I couldn't say no. Okay, I got it. One last question, and then I'll, I'll uh, sign the bill and hand it to you. Yes, please. The uh, hand bill. Do you want these letters gilded? Yes. I mean, it's, you know, ah, it's, my, fa- you know, it's my father. It's my, it's, 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 he was a, a prince of a man. Okay. Slave All of, right. H- Hank, yep. you want some gilded. Oh. What? <laughs> gilded? You can't at that... that, that. Font, you can't gild it. He wants some gilded. All right, I got to talk to my guy. I'll, I'll get back to you. There's no Hank, is there? <laughs> no, okay. Hank is me. Right. Hey, I do that too when the solicitors come to my door. I pose as my sure. footman. Oh, but yeah, that's a just a, a, a stunning thing for her to have to go and then read after the footman told her to sort of get the hell off his doorstep. She goes and reads that. And then... Cop, she, cop was behind her telling her to read it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> But then Hugh uh, finally approaches her, and it's just like, what, what's going on? Why do you—who uh, um, wh- is this person here? So, it's like, is, is there going to be a tearful reunion with the mother he never knew? 
No, there is not. <laughs> Hugh goes into beast this mode so... here. Utterly savage. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, I'll just read some, uh, read some of those. Yeah, please things. do. Yeah. Mighty heavens, exclaimed Sir Hugh Dunfern. Are you the vagrant who ruined the very existence of him who you now profess to have loved? You, the wretch of wet... The wretch of wicked and willful treachery, and formerly the wife of him before whose very bones you falsely kneel? Are you the confirmed traitoress of the trust reposed in you by my late lamented dearest and most noble of fathers? Are you aware that the hypocrisy you manifested once has been handed down to me as an heirloom of polluted possession and stored within this breast of mine, which very much resembles yours, I've been told, an indelible stain (laughs) for life, or, I might say, during your known and hated existence, false woman, wicked wife, detested mother, bereft widow, woman of stray, sin and stray companion of tutorism, which is pretty damn funny, I would say. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and then he, he, false woman, wicked wife. Uh, He turns around like, where'd you go? (laughs) Oh, oh, she's like a quarter mile away by this time. Yeah. I don't have to sit there and take this. It's like (laughs) someone on a roast, you know, they're, they're slapping their knee if they're the victim of the roast while this is happening. But this is, this is all just pretty harsh stuff. She's wearing those giant sunglasses and her mascara is just like completely ruined at this point. We also just imagine her being like, I was actually just here with the, uh, with a DoorDash delivery, sir. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the, another one of those, um, an entire, uh, you know, monologue, like very, very long monologue with no, no reaction in the middle of it. Yeah, it says no, it. No, like, but, yeah. and then, you know, an M dash. I am talking. I am talking. You know, no, <laughs> yeah, like, wa- throw, wine thrown in his face like a real housewife would. Yeah. It even acknowledges it. It says, speechless, you don't say, and dogged, did the dishonored mother steal forever from the presence of her son. So that's an amazing only interaction that she will ever have. It's, you know, he, he just berates the hell out of her and then she uh, steals away. And then uh, she uh, strolls on down. And again, we I I'm picturing these estates are like in a little triangle a mile and a half away from each other yeah they're also they're all within walking distance they're all you know, fortunately close because people need to be able to travel back and forth uh she she goes to uh audley hall mm-hmm. which i confess once again i had to had to look that up well that was yeah it was the house she lived in and, and oscar sold yes uh with two uh how did he do it, by the way? He didn't own it, but he's like, I can I sell you the Brooklyn Bridge? I guess so, yeah. It's Florida Swamp But then land. he so then he had to contact the real owners or something. It's kinda like when, you know, uh at Rift Tract or something, occasionally you'll buy a movie from someone who doesn't actually own it. Right. You know? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so you, what was your game uh, here? Okay. <laughs> yes. So then you just have to buy it again from right. the actual owner. So maybe that's what he was doing. But uh so she she knocks loudly twice before any attempt was made to open the door, which is odd. I guess we're just supposed to get the idea of like, you know, the TV is blaring the price is right or something. <laughs> like, uh, come on, man. Well, uh, well, what, what does she normally do? Just she goes, she typically just goes and expects <laughs> someone's going to come. Like, you know, the second knock is really what she's what she's calling attention to here. Uh, I, I guess that that's supposed to be like an affront to him. Like, yeah, stop your knocking. Like I knocked twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is major. Oh, damn it. Stop me up again. It doesn't matter. Idsley. It, who cares? It is lay. Idsley. Idsley. But okay. Idsley. Yeah. I said lay. I, damn. Yeah. Our irony. Idsley. I think. Idsley. Ask the saddened widow. <laughs> oh, madam. He has been dead almost 12 years, and since then no one has occupied this hall save me, who am the caretaker. The Marquis of Orland was deceived by his nephew, who sold it in an underhanded manner to the major, and he resolved that never again would he allow it to be occupied since the major's death by any outsider. In other words, he just spit on her feet. And told her to go to hell. Yeah, and he doesn't know it. He doesn't know it's her. Right. Yeah. And he's uh, he admits the guy there that he lives alone. He's like, I enjoy. Uh, so, but he's 
just takes this opportunity. I guess he doesn't talk to a lot of people. He takes this opportunity to get some good jabs in. <laughs> and yes. Irene has to start wondering if she's getting punked at this point in time. Like her, her uncle's been dead for 12 years. Her husband has this huge tombstone. Her son berates her. But this guy. Well, can I just ask one question before you get into this? Uh-huh. Why isn't it just major? Why does it have to be a second guy? Like, Major wouldn't recognize her from a hill of beans. Like, who gives a shit? Like, <laughs> why is it a second guy who's then like, well, I'm not him. Well, but if he were here, he would say. <laughs> well, they, he dies because she's hoping that um, he'll have left her something in his will as her, her own, his only surviving relative. But this guy just says, oh, now, uh, he, took, uh, he took that broad out on his deathbed and said to just take all the money and build that church over there. <laughs> so it is just more just like, you know, and now we're going to bring the seal out and club it in front of you type of thing. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying that could have been done by the guy. Right. Who's like, if I ever meet that woman, you know, I would. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But but so his, uh, his his jabs are, he says, I have always been accustomed to living alone, being an old bachelor, and wish to remain so. It's better to live a life of signal, singleness than to torture both body and soul by marrying a woman who doesn't love you like the good Sir John Dunfern. <laughs> so yeah, he doesn't know who she is, and she's just saying this out of the blue. Uh, she eventually ran off with a poor tutor and brought the hairs of hoary whiteness of Sir John Dunfern to the grave much sooner than in all probability they would have had he remained like me. So Irene's just like looking around for the camera, being like, uh, "Can I? Can I just talk to anyone who doesn't think this is the all greatest right. guy in the world?" <laughs> Uh, sh- uh, look, I'm going to knock on your neighbor's door and hope that that's not a person who will then spend 15 minutes insulting me. He opens the door. I'm just watching a 10 part documentary about Sir John Dunfern, you know? All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, apparently this, this guy who I assume just eats TV dinners and lives in the, mm-hmm. the oddly estate. And who just wants to be a bachelor? Yeah. <laughs> just because there's no way that he would ruin himself with a woman? Like, what kind of a rich life is this guy leading? He doesn't even have a PS4 or anything. He's just like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, this is it. I, I, I have two potatoes and I don't have to share them. No, if, I, if I was married, <laughs> I, you know, that wife would want one. And wow, it's just great to have two. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he scratches his... Uh, his uh, uh, jockey shorts and closes the door and then that's that's it yep peels off the uh, cellophane of his hungry man uh <laughs> yeah, laments that goes, the fruit compote uh, got in with the green beans <laughs> uh, what a life <laughs> uh the only other thing i have in this chapter was just as she was walking to this guy's house it says she heard the approach of horse's feet and stopping to act the part of lot's wife gave such a haggard stare at the driver of the vehicle as caused him to make a sudden halt how haggard was the stare? I, that's a pretty haggard stare. Yeah, I mean, he, he screeches his, the brakes on his horse carriage because the stare is so <laughs> haggard. I mean, it's just probably a testament to her beaten downness, but uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think the final chapter. The final chapter is finally here. Chapter 19 of, uh, of I.I. Um, which sh- it looks like, as you look at it just in size, looks like a little coda, but uh, it contains some uh, some very nice treasures. It does. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty hilarious. Does it start with so, the fortune uh, cookie? I didn't write one down. Uh, yes, it does. Okay. Well, hope sinks in a s- hope sinks a world of imagination. It, in almost every instance, never fails <laughs> to arm the opponents of justice with weapons of friendly defense and gains their final fight with peaceful submission. Uh, and how does that relate to what we've just spent, you know, three weeks discussing here? I, I'll say it again. If you're not reading along, if you are, you know it's in front of your eyes and you can't believe it either. It is in almost every instance, never fails to arm (laughs) the opponents of justice with weapons of friendly defense and gains their final fight with peaceful submission. I I mean, yeah, it's (laughs) terrible, obviously. My only, you know, my nitpick is if you're opposing justice, can your weapons really be friendly? I'm not sure how that... I don't. I have no idea how it relates to all this, but there's where I would start the editing process. Yeah. Also, 
I assume if you're going to misuse or switch up the the metaphor that you would, she does that often in the service of alliteration. <laughs> but this one isn't even alliteration, so there was no reason to 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 fumble that one. Uh, someone we did a meme contest on Patreon, and someone po- posted one of the memes, which was you know Anakin and and Amidala in the meadow that 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 format, and Anakin was labeled as a uh, as a uh, semicolon. And uh, Amidala's like, you're going to end the sentence, right? You're you're going to end the sentence, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, but not we get it starts with that, but that is of course burying the lead, which is that the next morning. So this is after she the, the next day after the uh, guy has said he enjoys his bachelor life. After the trying adventures of the lonely outcast was the scene of wonder at Dilworth Castle. Henry Hawks, our, fa- our favorite head gardener <laughs> under the Marquis of Orland, on approaching the little summer house in which Irene Idsley so often sat in days of youth, was horrified to find the dead body of a woman, apparently a widow, lying prostrate inside its mossy walls. Now, how is that apparent? <laughs> he just like he, he pokes it with a stick and is like, "Oh, this is a widow." I see. <laughs> oh, uh, the body is cold and stiff. We find out later. So, uh, yes. is that part of it? Like, well, widows they go stiff pretty quick. So, yeah, this is definitely a widow. It's got that I'm stink Henry about Hawks. it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It said. It does say she lay cold, stiff, and lifeless. At, if you're not reading, uh, let complete the metaphor. She lay cold, stiff, and lifeless as, um, what, what do you think it says, people at home? As a, uh, as a, as a, as a fallen tree, as a, um, as a, as a slab of cement. As Nero, <laughs> famed fiddler <laughs> while Rome burns, uh, Emperor Nero. Uh, I don't know if that was just a uh, expression that sort of fell out of favor as it, we got further and further away from that. Um, but that's that well-known, cold, stiff, lifeless person. <laughs> I mean, it was only a few years before this book was written. It's, it's, it's way in the distant past now, but this was still like one of four things that had happened. So they were still referencing it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So this was, I guess, the building that Sir John heard her oh. doing a- Italian music in. Consorting the first time he caught them. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. So th- 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 I think this is supposed to have significance, uh, but uh, oh, okay, I, I, she went back to the house where she like met her love for the first time. Yes, and and as it says here, this is what I'm trying to figure out. She was suicidal. Yes, it says that. Uh, so she comes to this house, uh, which is you know lived in. I mean, I, 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 at least the grounds are lived in. I could check back in my notes about who exactly lives here now. <laughs> I, I have the bill of sale in my You're notes right. here. But um, but people, you know, presumably this is, you know, Howard, what's his name? Howard Hawks? No. Howard Hughes? Henry Hawks. Oh. Henry Hawks is, uh, you know, doing the weed whipper on this place every, you know, every other day. Well, he's employed by Hugh, who, you know, berated her. I mean. Yeah. The Marquis of Orland. <laughs> oh, and yeah. uh, so he... So he's doing the the cottage every couple of days. He's mowing the lawn. He's got to water the uh, the ficus and whatever. And uh, but she's suicidal, so she goes there to uh, to die of starvation. That's what she, <laughs> that's what she wandered there to do as a suicidal person. And you know, so uh, how does she? How does that plan? You know, she'd like hide when he comes around and is like, I know you're in there. I've got some muffins. Like, no, Never. I'm committing suicide. <laughs> well, you laugh, but it worked perfectly. She died of starvation overnight. <laughs> <laughs> she had been eating. Just... She had that scanty breakfast at uh, Fanny Durant's house. And I guess that was the last thing she ate, which was, you know, the day before. So she really, uh, she, I don't know, metabolism must be must be crazy on her. But she had stayed at Fanny Danford's house, she said, until she restored her health and everything. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as we said, she was plowing down the, uh, you know, Cocoa Puffs and stuff and seemed fine. Uh, that's they, they, But then she's suicidal, so she goes, I'm going to go to this cottage, not eat dinner, <laughs> and therefore die of starvation? <laughs> it's Right? Is that That's the timeline. Yeah, just like Nero. 
course. But no, that is the time. No, okay, now we, now I understand. We, we, we parsed this out because it was so absurd, but it says, I mean, it, the, the chapter says, Henry Hawks, the next morning after the trying adventures of the Lonely Outcast, discovers the body. Um, so it is sort of like if you've ever, you know, had a, had a cold or just like gone to bed without supper, that's, uh, that, that could happen to you any time. You could starve to death overnight. <laughs> Okay, so does that mean... So that's the second paragraph of this final chapter. The next morning means the next morning after chapter... The previous chapter? After the trying adventures of the Lonely Outcast, yeah. And that was her okay. going to the store... To the... Um, both houses, reading the tombstone. I mean, that that's all that could be... It's all it could mean. Yeah, of course. I don't, okay, you know, I just wanted to make sure there was no out, like she didn't say, the next morning... Because, you know, she has the the fortune cookie, the two, the full paragraph of fortune cookie sort of clouds the beginning of the chapter. Yeah. But the real beginning of the chapter is the next morning. Yeah. Right. The, the, this might as well be in italics, the fortune cookie. Yes. Like yes. The, do, the, the, the dolling. dolling piece. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, I, uh, I don't think it's unclear at all. I mean, and that's why I've okay. started sleeping with a, uh, a pouch of pizzeria pretzel combos in my bedside stand <laughs> so I could wake up and have a few in the middle of the night. So I, you know, I'm, you do not want to. I mean, are you? Life is going good for you, so you're. I, I, maybe you have to have a suicidal mind as you. Okay. De- deliberately go to bed with no go to supper. Starve. Yeah. Just be like, all right, boys, we're shutting it down. Everyone on the inside's like, here, here, <laughs> like, boop. <laughs> Guys are, are doing the protests. The not eating pro- starvation protests are like, nah. It's going to take you at least thirty five. <laughs> oh, you did it! Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, they're they're the people who are leading those protests are like, you can't be more like Irene. Look at her. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's, wow. It's a uh, it's a it's a four year old's understanding of how that might work. Throw it in here at the very end, uh, or maybe some some R- Salman Rushdie magical realism or something. Well, but it's also odd that it didn't include the fact that she went to starvation is funny, given the fact that Sir John, you know, his blood vessels in his heart are bursting when he hears about his footman, you know, <laughs> being fired or whatever. Right. Or that her, it's like it could, her other husband literally drowned himself. So, like, there's not a, you know, there's a precedent here for dispatching yeah. yourself easily and quickly. And it, it just, it's funny that it couldn't be something that she, uh, uh, it's just the, the worst thing she could have picked, right? <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine anything else. <laughs> right, yeah. She died of like, she knew that there was, uh, you know, an outbreak of uh, bed bugs in this place. So she yep. <laughs> threw herself upon the bed and the bed bugs consumed her or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least then we'd be like, maybe the bed bugs were stronger back in 1897. That could have been, uh, yeah. yeah, what do we know? Um, uh, uh, that's that's the, I, I have one last note, which is the end of the book. So I don't know if there's anything else we need to discuss. Uh, the only thing I want to ask is because it's mentioned again because Hugh comes mm-hmm. from London to like spit on her grave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. It was only a lapse of a few minutes after the widowed waif left Dunfern Mansion. I'm sure she was a waif because she hadn't. She was starving to death. So yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. It's like I guess good old Henry just threw her bag of bones over his shoulder. He blew on it and it sort of rolled like a tumbleweed. <laughs> Yeah, but minutes after that, so he's just peeling off down the driveway, Hugh arrives from London. Mm -hmm. Uh, After bidding his mother quit the grounds owned by him, so I guess he sent directions ahead. Like, when I get there, her her corpse better be... (laughs) scraped off the tarmac and uh you know <laughs> thrown in the garbage and and throw it out in the actual truck on the street uh, not uh, uh blotted her name forever from his book of memory and being strongly prejudiced by a father of faultless bearing sir john yeah right re- resolved that the sharers of beauty youth and false love should never have the slightest catch on his affection so Hugh from London, whatever the hell he's doing in London, Mm -hmm. is a bachelor for life because there's no way. So I don't know whether he's going to go live with that guy. Yeah, the guy's like, wow, you finally came around. I have so much to teach you, my son. Ding! There's your hungry man, Hugh. (laughs) Come on in. (laughs) And and the day begins. (laughs) Why are you putting on pants, you idiot? Yeah. 
But that's the end of the book. That's the, how the book ends. Yes. And does it, so is that implying he, the sharers of beauty, youth, and false love should never have the slightest catch on his affection? So that's a vow of celibacy that is how the book ends? I, well, celibacy is strong. We don't okay, know. Okay, sure, I mean, yeah. But just affection. Ne- right, yeah. But, yes. George Clooney, you said, like a, a well, he's yes. a lifelong bachelor. Wow. Yep. I'm picturing he never, it's like sock garters. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and those uh, the big uh, big underpants <laughs> and a t shirt with a slogan on the front of it, yeah. and yeah, Last it never night's, takes them uh, off. Nacho cheese stain on the t shirt, for sure. And living with that guy, there's uh, yeah, that's the end. Wow. Oh, I got to tell you, Hugh, uh, rough stuff would happen to your old lady, but uh, if that if she had never starved herself to death, we would never be here watching this. Uh, I love the '90s marathon right now, and I can't think of a better way to do it. Hey, uh, pick me up uh, Dos Equis from the fridge when you get up. Yeah. Will do, compadre. Uh, oh, hang on. Let me just get this note. Oh, hey, remember that footman we fired a while back? Oh, yeah. What, uh, Tom? He, he was something. like 97. The guy died. <laughs> oh, shit. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I mean, not a happy end to the book, but the, I think it's the, it's the ending it deserves, <laughs> you know. In fact, a very funny ending to the book, I would say. <laughs> Oh, delightful. Uh, as we said, like not even a, you know, a glycerin tear from Hugh as he walks away, you know, like icily from his mother's corpse or something like, nope. Yeah. He, he tosses a match he's... over his, uh, over his shoulder and burns it to the ground. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's so, so good. Yeah. You just, you, you sort of get that. Uh, what do you think the, the, the takeaway here is? What was her moral? What was she? I mean, obviously all books had to have a moral in the old times. What, what do you think it was, it was here? I mean, I guess uh, a false woman rules, ruins a good man. Yeah, is that, I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, it's twisted, but that's, I think that's maybe what she was saying. I mean, I, I suppose it could be, uh, you know, if it's her anniversary gift and she presents it to her husband, if she knows he's been, you know, cheating on her on business trips or something, that could be sort of her way of letting letting him know that she knows type of thing and all these tragedies befall these people. I, yeah, that could be. Uh, when you were uh, saying that you were selling our third manor that uh, last February, I, I knew you were away in London with that tart. <laughs> you know, so here's your book. Uh, well, I could totally imagine uh, Mark Twain and the uh, C.S. Lewis slapping their thigh as they, they read about her dying of sort of starvation in a matter of hours. So, you know, you, you uh, tip my hat. Well, it got... It got you, right? Oh, yeah. My, and and his, yeah. His, uh, his, oh, thank God, as he finishes his stories. I mean, those are both funny moments. I'm not, yeah. not sure yeah. if they're um, as, as laugh out loud throughout the book as it was, but I definitely think there was some material here that would have greatly amused those old-timey guys. Yeah, I think uh, the, you know, the prose is obviously somewhat impenetrable, mm-hmm. but the plot is pretty hilarious. Yes. And uh and even the prose itself, it, it gets a little wearying. I would not want to read any longer. No, yeah, this, yeah. That's for the sure. The length was just right. Yeah, perfect. No, I, I liked it a lot. Well, let's uh, let's wrap it up with some dumb yeah. here. Of course, as usual, a lot of them are submitted by our Patreon supporters, our dear, beloved Tom Hepworth Patreon supporters, as opposed ah, to... Salt of the Earth. As opposed to those Rachel Hydes. Who just listen without <laughs> helping out? Um, uh, but we appreciate them all. They get uh, fun stuff. We get, for instance, this week we we discussed our our burgeoning roles as crypto guys, and my attempt to convince a uh, contractor to install an antenna on my roof to mine a cryptocurrency, which he was unable to really comprehend what I was talking about. I. I uh... Labeling us crypto guys is like, <laughs> yeah, we're like someone, we're like you. Someone we mailed, yes, someone mailed me a a helium box <laughs> that I plugged in. If that makes me a crypto guy, <laughs> just start using so rocket ship emojis in all your correspondence, and we'll we'll take it from yes. there. Um, but yeah, so it's patreon.com slash 372 pages. You get the episodes early. You get the bonus stuff, contests. You'll get to find out the next book before anybody else. So if that sounds good, uh, head on over and help us out. It's really fun. And we really appreciate it. Uh, first sentence, this is from Balaji, who said, this was so bad it made me audibly gasp and pause to read it aloud to my annoyed wife. Uh, this is, we, we touched on it, but this is the whole context of the Dark and Stormy Night ripoff. 
because uh, it was more than just one that that sentence. Okay. The night was dark and tempestuous. The hill rather inclined to be steep. The clouds were bathed in wrinkled furrows of vapory smoke. The traffic on the quiet and lonely road surrounding Dunfern Mansion was utterly stopped, and nature seemed a block of obstruction to the eye of the foreigner who trudged, drudged so wearily up the slope that led to the home of Mrs. Durand, who had been confined to bed for the past three years, a sufferer. 170. Oh, that's the. Uh, I, I copied that. A oh sufferer goodness. from rheumatism. So I didn't even I didn't pick up on that that Mrs. Duran had been confined to bed for the past three years. Irene shows up and she starts making her breakfast and starts saying things like dinner won't be necessary. Yeah. That's even better. <laughs> you know what? Uh, you stay there moaning in pain over your rheumatism. I got dinner. I'm, I'm covered. I'll pick up a sack of twenty on the way home. Uh, this one's from Jim. All these thoughts seized the blighted protector of the late Colonel Idsley's orphan daughter, and being gradually augmented by many others of private and public importance, rose like a tumor of superfluous matter and burst asunder on receiving the last blow relative to poor old Tom Hepworth. And his his only comment was, It didn't occur to me to this latest episode, but now I can't hear Idsley without thinking it's pig Latin for slid. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, Elizabeth submitted, hope sinks a world of imagination. She said, I have no idea what she's trying to slay here. Yeah, I didn't either. I wasn't, you know, hope floats. Isn't that the traditional thing that hopes do? It doesn't sink. (laughs) It's the exact opposite. Uh, This was submitted by Mike. He said, another side of the picture of futurity presented for the anxious mother, and that was to try and obtain an interview with her son, who at this period must be a boy of some 15 summers. (laughs) Mike said, very Kleinian. His exact age is both known to the character and the narrator, so just say he was 15. <laughs> Must be. <laughs> um, uh, Mark Berger submitted, uh, he was tempted to invest in the polluted stocks of magnified extension, and when their banks seemed swollen with rotten gear, gathered too often from the winds of willful wrong, how the misty dust blinded his sense of sight and drove him through the field of fashion and feeble effeminacy, which he never once meant to tread, landing him on the slippery rock of smutty touch to wander into the hidden cavities of ancient fame, (gasps) there to remain a blinded son of injustice and unparalleled wrong. It ends with an exclamation point. (laughs) God. Uh, There, what? Ponderous, man. (laughs) Yeah, really? (laughs) Ponderous. Casey Kasem knew nothing of what that word meant. (laughs) Craig submitted... The living sometimes learn the touchy tricks of the traitor, the tardy, and the tempted. The dead have evaded the flighty earthly future and to form, to swell, the retinue of retired rights, the righteous school of the invisible, and the rebellious roar of raging nothing. And he just asked, Pappy Pariah, is that you? (laughs) Uh, Uh, Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Dumb question. I don't think I know what the word retinue means. Does it just mean like set of something? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I would not be able to use it in a sentence, but I've heard it before and would have thought before this I would have been able to tell you what it means. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just having someone use it, I'm always like, is there another word? Yeah. Is retinue? Come on, yeah. we don't use that anymore. A group of, anyway, a group I don't of feel advisors, assistants, or others accompanying an important in person. The rock stars. Oh, retinue, retinue, like a, okay, a set of people helping. An yes, entourage, okay. yeah. An entourage. Okay. This was Thank submitted you. by three separate people, uh, Chap, Arthur, and Amanda. But President O'Sullivan, this is another long one, <laughs> whose well-guided words and fatherly advice had on this evening so sealed the mind of forgiveness with the wax of disinterested intent that Sir John, on his arrival home, at once sent for his solicitors, Messrs. Hutchinson and Harper, and ordering his will to be produced, demanded there and then that the pen of persuasion be dipped into the ink of revenge and spread thickly along the paragraph of blood-related charity to blank the intolerable words that referred to the woman he was now convinced, <gasps> beyond doubt, had braved the bridge of bigamy. And I think this was... You know, you know that C.S. Lewis spilled his, uh, his IPA uh, <laughs> at the, uh, the, the eagle and claw uh, when, the, when, when Tolkien read that one out loud to him. So. <laughs> Chap's uh, comment was, Tyra Banks may have been a little too proud of her adverbs, but how much irrational self-confidence is required to to encourage someone to poke the word of six times into a single sentence? Wow. Yeah. And uh, last one was from Hayden. Drawing forth of a chair beside the... uh, Beside of the August patient, Hugh, quite unprepared, received the awful intelligence of his mother's conduct and life from the lips of the inf- afflicted, who, in broken accents, 
related the tale of trouble for which years had kept him a prisoner to its influence. And Hugh just says, how many accents did he try, I wonder? <laughs> uh, that was at uh, Fanny's door, right? Where she had the, the accent? Uh, oh, was it the also? Weekend... No, I, I think she had she tried her weekend accent at Fanny's door, huh. too. So uh, well, it was a thing she had. She had been abroad for a while, so it was probably like the spring break thing of coming back where you, you she's talking in a, in a New York accent. So she's like, yeah, hey, you know, Fanny, I'm knocking here twice. Our own uh, uh, Sean Thomason goes back to the Hollers in Virginia mm-hmm. and has, says he has to fight his accent when he comes back. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you, you get it. Yeah. Uh, do you have any that we have not touched on? I think I do. Um, please stop me if this was read because I was kind of looking over my notes at some of them. But I think this is new. Uh, there she was, a stranger in a foreign land. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a nice cliche. I, 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 An outcast to the society she shone so brilliantly amongst during years that were now no more, the fostered orphan, the adopted daughter of heiress nothing, the wife of devotional distinction, the illegal partner of crutchy poverty, <laughs> and the penniless widow of undeniable woe. God. I think it was crutchy poverty that that uh, made me pick that one out is pretty good. It does sound like a, uh, a video a hospital would show to some sick kids where it's like, hey, kids, I'm crutchy. You don't have to be afraid to walk <laughs> around with me. I'm friendly. I help you get better. Crutchy, crutchy and casty. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I, I had many more, but I think they were kind of covered. And a lot of them are just that kind of that long thing where you go, oh, my God. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's it's, it's it, just the semicolons and commas and um, yeah. that it, it makes them dumb by virtue of just their pure construction, no matter what they say. My one right. that didn't get burnt was this is when Oscar is trying to find Irene. Uh, I think, you know, before he killed himself, he was, you know, she was. Who's, who's Irene? Now? <laughs> God. Hi. Oh, man. We've got sorry. like five sorry, more minutes sorry. to. <laughs> I know. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Oscar says uh, his various inquiries regarding her whereabouts proved vain as the vanishing shadow of Venus. Just a, mm. it's a settle down dumb sentence. You know what does that? I don't know what does that mean. I, Venus had probably been discovered the year before, and she was trying to like make some cool like uh, topical references to it. Oh, okay. I was thinking of like the the you know Venus uh, women's razor is now my uh, <laughs> context for it. Yeah, it's a planet. I mean, that's that's a pretty well known. <laughs> that's how far down the road I am of modernity. Uh, all right. Well, those are dumb sentences. We do have some emails we can read uh, pretty quickly. We ain't going to the party. We ain't going to the game. We ain't going to the dinner. Ain't gonna cruise out, man. All right. These are emails. A lot of them also from our beloved, beloved Patreon supporters. Ah, oh, they're such hapworks. All of yes. them. I mean, oh, could, man. be our footmen any day. Yes. Um, first one is from Lucas. As promised, uh, the real or fanfic statistics are in. Mike scored 7 out of 10. So that 70% puts your total average at 58.39%, an increase of 39%. So, I mean, it takes all... Oh, the percentage increase is huge. But yeah, it is like a a baseball team trying to reach their magic number. It's just so hard. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, so yeah, if you had had gotten a 10 out of 10, it might have raised your your average thing by like 0.6%. So it's it's a hard road ahead at this point in time. But, you know, it's an improvement. And for that, we... Um, he said, Lucas says, I wish there was nothing more to say, but unfortunately not much to talk about for books this short. Right. All right. Uh, well, if short books help me, let's just do short <laughs> books. Uh, Elizabeth said, I just have to point, mention how ironic it is. This book full of incredibly horrible relationships was published as an anniversary present. Why didn't she bother to have at least one good marriage to compare Irene's poor choices to? Makes me wonder how happy she was at home. Maybe she was writing this book from her own murder room. Um, she did write more books, so you know you never know uh, what happened there. Maybe uh, maybe the footman's the, the villain of the next one. Uh, Doug said Sir John's deathbed monologue to his son would have been shorter and less convoluted if he'd recapped all seven seasons of Lost. I agree. <laughs> he also probably would have said, oh, thank God, when that was all over, too. I think that was my reaction yes. when we turned off the TV when Lost was done. Yes. Uh, we get this. This was I mean, this was sort of disappointing because I, I thought it was so perfect. But it is. Uh, I'm going to share it anyway. This is from Ben. Listening to Connor's skepticism about 1800s humor reminded me of this joke published the same year as Irene Italy. The It's called The Best Gorilla Joke of 1897. 
<laughs> it's called that? Yeah, it has okay. a big title. Gorilla. Okay. Did you hear about the gorilla who escaped from the zoo? Zookeeper. No, I did not. Gorilla. That is because I am a quiet gorilla. Parenthetical. Muffled sounds of gorilla violence. <laughs> and I said, that is hilarious. I, I, of course, looked it up, and uh, it is not from 1897. It's from a Tumblr post from November of 2020. <laughs> okay. But the year right. being the same is pretty damn crazy. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Someone trying to cast their mind back to uh, insult the jokes. Of... <laughs> um, this is from Emily. She is currently reading Vladimir Nabokov's Ada. And she says, have a quote. I am sentimental, she said. I could dissect a koala, but not its baby. I like the words damsel, eglantine, elegant. I love when you kiss my elongated white hand. And she says, slender fingers are everywhere. <laughs> wow. I found some in a, uh, in a book I was reading, a nonfiction book. I was reading Michael Pollan's The Botany of Desire, and he's talking about uh, weed. He says, its purplish green leaves are shorter and rounder than the long, slender fingers of sativa. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. Wow. So that's pretty even, cool. even weed has uh has long hands. Amazing. Yeah. Um I have a couple more. I got somehow off of the emails right now. Uh oh yeah, so listeners Don and Mike wrote in. We decided to explore some other works of Amandra McKittrick Ross and happened upon her collection of poetry. Uh it appeared to her she had a great disdain for lawyers and many of the poems excrete lawyers of her acquaintance with particular attendance to their physical shortcomings. Um, so maybe that's why those lawyers were not uh, explained to be of the the most honorable and uh, only the only the doctors were. But the- uh, I was trying trying to come up with their names here. I got to get them down in my mind. Uh, well, I'll look through my notes. But go on. But this, the last they, you can, people should look into them because they are pretty funny. Um, you know, buttocks getting whipped with fishing hooks, um, stuff like that. But the the finally he says one of them said uh, in what what must surely be the best opening nine of all of literature. The poem is called Easter Tide, and the opening line is, Dear Lord, the day of eggs is here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which I think I told them would be like a, a chilling first line of a Shirley Jackson book or something. Wow. Day, and, and the construction is perfect. Day of eggs. Yes, yes. <laughs> or Ray that Bradbury is a funny... comes across you know, every 30 years, the day of eggs, and everyone, you know, the eggs come and kill people. That's a funny thing that my so in my household I uh, I make eggs for my wife only when she wants them mm-hmm. and I will say is today an egg day <laughs> and uh, she will say uh, yes or no based on that and then I will make the eggs and then I like a chef you call out I will say eggs up and she has to respond because she's in another room because otherwise the eggs get cold uh-huh. right yeah so when I started speaking French I. <laughs> or practicing French, I would call it out as, uh, you know, in French, it's the day of the eggs on a plate is basically what you say. (laughs) And she would respond, oui, uh, you know, merci, and that would be, but the construction is the same, day of eggs. Amazing. That's what I would say in French. Maybe she... And I I think I said that this morning, yeah. (laughs) So next time you, uh, next time you bolt upright, You'll have to, uh, or awoke, next time you awake with a start. Awake with a you'll start. Have to say, Dear yes. Lord, the day of eggs is here. La journée de la ouf de la plate. Uh, Janelle wrote in to inform us that a user uh, on, on Discord named Jorkily found out that the longest sentence in the book was what's your guess here? How many words? Uh, well, I'm looking at one of my dumb sentences. I'm going to say, let's see, how many. Uh, no, I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to just say um, 65 words. 128 words. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> it begins, what must have been the breathless surprise of Lady Dilworth chiefly. So I guess it's from the beginning of the book when she was still Lady Dilworth and not uh, not the widow. Well, the very beginning of the book is Hugh getting the... Oh, uh, of course. <laughs> the, the well-known guy. Getting castle <laughs> ticket. He's, uh, yeah, he's living there in his bachelorhood. That's what, that's what we described. He turned yeah. into the neighbor on office space and is, uh, is heating up his hungry man of, of walnuts. Uh, last email I'm going to read here. Uh, maybe we can do a bonus with other things, um, other emails. But this was from Erin. She said, I'm sure you've gotten several emails about the Irene is a portrait theory that the Patreon Discord jackals cooked up. I did not uh, see any more emails to that effect, but 
the theory, I guess, is a uh, that that he observed her portrait on that first thing because that's how he knew her by the great artist Pito, and then yeah, the, rest Pito, of the, sure. the rest of the book was just his uh, his hallucination of this this um, beautiful woman he saw in a portrait. But why? Because that's what people do. They they take oh, okay. <laughs> they take right. the well, theories and then they expand upon them. Four, she says, I like this theory a little too much, in fact, and the result is that I wrote an 800, eight, 8,500 word fanfic based on the theory. If you don't want... 85, that's like probably the length of the book, right? Uh, yeah, it's probably like three sentences. <laughs> she said, if you don't want to read the whole thing, uh, and why would you? Here's a spoiler-free synopsis. A starving artist named Pito obtains magical powers... Um, I'm going to post the uh, link uh, for people who are interested in reading a 8,500 word Irene Isley fanfic by Aaron. So <laughs> enjoy that if you do. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't know why the theory. Uh, well, so Pito obtains magical powers, uh, allows him to charm the viewer of his works. And thinking he's a great artist, he paints portraits for the wealthy and gains the acclaim he always sought. While painting Irene's portrait, he becomes obsessed with her and uses a magical power that binds him and his work subject together until the portrait is destroyed. The real Irene is trapped inside her own portrait until the Irene everyone sees and interacts is just a vision. The vision of Irene is controlled by those around her, including her parents, Sir John, Marjorie, and Oscar. Why? I still can't answer you. But people okay. people have theories like the uh, in Starship Troopers, like the bug attack was just a, a false flag planted by the government. Sure. Why you would spend your your time on Earth defending Starship Troopers as a work of satire and con, you know coming up with things that are not present on screen in any way or even hinted at to to defend that crazy theory? I don't know, but that's what people do. All right, well, let's make a movie on it. Like the what's the room, the the one on Kubrick? And, oh yeah, uh, Room Two Three uh, Seven. Shining. Yep, Two Yeah, three, it's seven. that type okay. of thing. Yeah, yeah. okay. The Calumet Good. making powder means that he faked the moon landing. Sure. Um, okay. And then we can make a YouTube series that's like it's a it's a picture of us sort of like smirking with our arms out and it has a weird background and it's you know part one of thirty three you know Irene Irene uh, portrait theory explained. Uh, that's that's our ticket to retirement. I, I think so. That's how we get set for life yeah. with a thousand dollars. You don't have to take a public school job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll take that pathetic five hundred dollar a month job. <laughs> Excuse me while I go slink back and eat cup of noodles. <laughs> Well, where do you put this one? I think it's up there. I think it's below uh, some of the other um, crazy, uh, weird uh, Amazon self-published tomes we've read. Below Moon People, below uh, DDT, yeah. below uh, Dwight. Da- I mean, uh, sorry, below Jim Tice, of course. But I don't know. Yeah. Yes, I would put it below that. Put it below Trucking Through Time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, a strong, a strong finisher. I, I I'd certainly put it above. I don't know, three quarters, 75% of our material. I think it's better than most. I think so. Uh, Uh, It's brevity, of course, is on its side. Absolutely, yep. And um, the fact that she was trying something, you know, this this is what she took her gift and did. She got an opportunity that nobody was afforded that, you know, if, if Amazon publishing had existed then, who knows how many other crazy people would have done stuff. But she had this opportunity... This is what she chose to say to the world <laughs> makes that to me. Uh, you know, there's there's no pretense about it. There's no uh, irony or anything. She just aired the grievances and boy, did she. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There is something about that when someone really strives and they just don't have it because it's, you know, again, not a slam on their character or anything. It's just like she just is not a talented <laughs> writer, but it's great to see someone grasping for something. And there's no reason not to be delighted by their failures in that. Yeah. So it was, yeah. It was pretty fun. Great. Well, thanks everyone who took the ride with us. Everyone who uh, listened along without reading. Everyone on Patreon who supports us. Uh, we'll uh, hit you back with something new uh, soon. But stay tuned and we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. We will try to make it, won't we? <laughs> Thank you all. Speaking of obscure references, so long, everyone. Bye.